a six-year-old granddaughter that he just adored and she adored him and when she turned six she began pestering her grandfather to let her help him make a carpet so on her seventh birthday he presented to her two of his very own favorite needles and he taught her three basic stitches and set her up on one end and he set up on the other and off she went weaving the carpet and she did not get a single stitch right not one but her grandfather so adored her and was such a master weaver and so wise that he steadily incorporated her mistakes into the overall pattern so that when they met in the middle it was another masterpiece i think that's the world that we live in this world according to the new testament belongs to jesus and his father and the holy spirit it's not our world and judging by what's going on in american politics right now there's a bunch of granddaughters and grandsons weaving their own pattern and they actually believe they know what they're doing and they don't but that doesn't change the fact that god adores us our father loves us he doesn't do abandonment and they are redeeming geniuses and by that i mean the father son and spirit don't do redemption on monday and then go back to being what they really are on tuesday they are redeeming geniuses because they love us and they're constantly at work in our lives to transfigure our mistakes uh and let's deepen that to transfigure our willful mistakes to transfigure uh the trauma that has happened to us and the trauma that we have ha we have done to others or created in others lives in order to bring life freedom goodness faithfulness the day is coming for you for me uh, and for me for the whole planet the whole world where we will be filled with the goodness of the father son and spirit we will be filled with their faithfulness their love will overflow out of us without our even thinking about it uh, it would horrify us to think of doing harm to any of our brothers and sisters or any of our father's creation that day's coming that is what redemption is all about in the big picture meantime we are in the midst of a life and if you're like me uh if you're like me you have spent a great deal of your adult time as a human being playing checkers and i don't mean the board game i mean trying to get myself crowned honored accepted even loved known but in and with and through my own checker moves self-centered self-protective checker moves in and with and through your own self-centered self-protective checker moves the holy spirit's playing three-dimensional trinitarian kingdom chess with our moves and when we see that when we get a glimpse of that when we get a glimpse of the fact that on our checkerboard which we call our lives in the ordinary moments driving down the road standing there looking at a can of soup at the grocery store having a conversation with a friend every now and then you get a glimpse of the presence of the holy spirit here now with jesus and the father inside our checker game inside our lives inside what's going on good bad whatever how we interpret it and the holy spirit is playing three-dimensional trinitarian kingdom chess with our moves and when that happens and it will happen if it hasn't when it happens it gives us a moment to pause to stop whoops i just saw something that sort of 
completely reinterpreted my existence. I think that's what the Bible means by uh, repentance. It's a terrible translation. The word is metanoia, uh, which means a radical change of the way you see things, which changes the way you relate to things, which changes the way you behave. But I think that when we see this, we see the presence and the goodness and the flowing, overflowing life uh, in our own lives and in our own journey and in our own darkness. We just have one of those great big oops moments where we just go, wait a minute. I, I don't know what that is. I don't know how to be a part of that, but it just revealed that what I've been doing with most of my life is a bunch of scuba love. Um, Philippians 3, 9, for those of you that want verses. And then we turn and we just say, Lord, I don't know how to get there. Uh, some of you think you do know how to get there, and that's okay. We all start there. Um, but there are moments in your life when you realize you don't even know how to spell life. You don't know how to spell perfection. You realize I wouldn't recognize holiness if it was staring me in the face because it is. They don't know what salvation is or how to be saved. And we just stop and we just say, Jesus, you are the good shepherd. I don't make you good. And I don't make you my shepherd. You are the good shepherd. You have been the good shepherd from the moment of creation. And I don't know how to get to green pasture. I don't know how to go from where I am right now in this very moment in my life. I don't know how to go from here to peace. I don't. Thought I did. I don't. So I want to walk with you. Would you help me? Because I don't even know how to take a step. So this is... This is growth. This is maturity. Uh, my grandson, one of my grandsons, I have four now, four grandchildren, two daughters, two granddaughters, and one and two grandsons. The absolute love of my life beside my children, my family. Can you see that? <laughs> That's Cooper, Jeb, Lucy, the newborn, and Caroline. But my grandson Cooper. Uh, he's four now. And when he was coming up toward his third birthday, he was over at our house. Oh, they were all over. We were cooking steaks for hamburgers or something. And, and there was something wrong with my grill. So it, me and Kyle, who's, who's uh, Cooper's dad, my daughter, Laura's husband, um, we're out there working on the grill. And Kyle's holding a flashlight and I got a screwdriver and I'm trying to get this thing tilted a certain way and connected because the wire had come loose or something. I don't know. And Cooper, who is not even three years old at this time, he comes barreling up in there and he reaches up and he grabs the screwdriver from my hand and he's pulling hard. And he looked at me like I was an idiot and said, I fix it. I fix it. And I, the instant it happened, I thought, Ooh, that, that's the story of my life. I'm resting the screwdriver from God's hands and I, I fix it. Well, and that's what we do. And that's why we follow all these yahoos that hold up a big old Bible and say, do this, do this, do this, do this. Do this. And it doesn't really make any changes inside of our own soul. We're not relieved. We're not healed. We're not able to take a step toward authenticity. We are just told this is the way you pose in this group. This is the kind of clothes you wear. This is the way you walk. You get your Bible. This, you know, uh, Cooper in that moment, um, I saw myself, I saw my life in a split second that, that we are trying to get ourselves crowned. We're convinced that we know how to do it. Uh, and off we go. And unfortunately this involves other people, uh, wives, husbands, friends, family, uh, children, workers, neighbors, and it, all of a sudden it gets to be a big mess. And that, that's where we are as a country right now. We're, we're easing toward realizing we don't have a clue how to fix this. 
And as we ease toward that as a country, as a people, and as we see the presence of the Holy Spirit, you're going to see a great awakening in this country and all it's already happening all over the world. But today we're not talking about the larger picture. We're talking about us. We're talking about what's going on inside of our soul. So what I want, where I want us to go, where I want you to go with me, if you're willing, is I want to explore the good shepherd and how the good shepherd made his way to the bottom of the abyss of our own delusion. And he brought his father and the Holy Spirit with him. And there they set up their tabernacle, their temple, where they dwell. And Jesus is determined. Just love this. Uh, John 17, 26, which is the last verse in Jesus's prayer before he goes to the cross. And if we've got time later on, um, we'll, we'll look at this more carefully. But I just want you to notice it. Two verses in John's gospel. One is John 14, 20. The other is John 17, 26. This is verse 26. Listen, Father, I have made you known to them. And I will make you know in order that the love, in order that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. Beginning of John 17, verse 3, Father, this is eternal life that they may know you. It's not about going to somewhere when we die. It's by knowing the Father. And Jesus, at the end of the prayer, Father, I have made you known. I have done it. I am inside the abyss of delusion where they have lost their minds and don't even know it, where they don't know you and therefore don't know peace. All they know is fear and guilt and shame. Father, I have made you know, and I will make you know. In order that the love with which you love me, I mean, you listening to this, in order that the love with which the Father loves the Son from all eternity may be inside of them, as much theirs as it is mine, that they would feel it and know it, and that I would lift their faces so they could see you with my eyes and experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit in their delusion. I have made you known, and I will make you known. I saw my father. Um, both of my parents have graduated to the cloud of witnesses. Um, but my dad had a wind down. Um, he had what was called Parkinsonian's disease, which for all practical purposes looks an awful lot like Alzheimer's to me. But my dad was a, a lawyer and a judge and a, a brigadier general in the National Guard. Not the kind of person that was not used, was used to saying something and not being listened to. And certainly not the kind of person who could communicate. But I watched my father wind down and I would go and I'd sit with him and we would always laugh. Um, that was the place he and one of the places he and I connected was laughter and uh, the other place was in fishing. Um, let me put it that a different way. One of the places that the Holy Spirit met both of us together was in laughter and in fishing because that's the three dimensional chess thing. Anyway, um, I watched my dad lose his capacity to speak what he was obviously thinking. And it had to be brutally painful, yet I saw joy in his soul. So I wrote a post-it note too. And I wrote John 17, 26. Father, I have made you known to Don Kruger. And I will make you known to Don Kruger in order that the love with which you love me may be in him and I in him. And I wrote that out like that on post-it note, put it by his bed, and I put one in the bathroom. And I sat there and I watched exposed the folly of what most of us have grown up with in religion because most of us have grown up with in, with religion is this is about you and your faith and your faithfulness 
And I thought, is the message that I'm supposed to be sharing with my dad as he winds down, dad, you got to hold on to your faith. If you lose your faith, you go, I'm like, he doesn't have any faith. Or if he has it, he doesn't know why he has it. The point of the gospel is not your faith. The point of the gospel is you have a shepherd. And he's the one that's determined that you know his father. I have made you known, Father, and I will. I accept responsibility for my children, my brothers and sisters, and they are lost. They are so lost that they hate me and don't want anything to do with me, won't come to me. John 3. I will make you known to Don Kruger. I said, Dad, that's what you focus on. That promise, that statement, that prayer of Jesus to his father, I will make you known. Now, to me, that is the picture, the real picture of the biblical story. We have, as a human race, lost our minds. And the thing about when you lose your mind, you're the last one in the room to know it because you think you can fix it. You think you got it figured out. That's my life. Uh, I don't know if you've ever met anyone or dealt with anyone that was um, delusional, but I got a call one day and, and from the psych unit here in, in my area and said, there's a patient here that's calling for you and even had your number. So I don't know who you are, but can you, so I went down there. I'd never been in the psych unit before. And I walked in, they let me in, gave me my little badge. And, you know, I was, I was escorted in and I walked into this room and there was this person that I knew I'd known for a good while, but her interpretation of where she was and what she was doing there and where she was going was completely unhinged. She knew my name and that was it. And I sat there thinking, how in the world do I begin to communicate with this person? <laughs> because everything I said, she was interpreting through her delusion. And it didn't matter how accurate I was or how true I was. She was interpreting it through her delusion. And there was no way I was trying to figure out how do you get around this thing? so that you can begin to have a conversation about what is real to someone who's convinced that they see reality and you don't. And the minute I crossed her interpretation, she cut me off and got angry and basically, you know, told the guard or the, the nurse or whatever, you know, it's time for me to leave. I drove home just thinking that that's the picture of redemption. That's the picture of the fall of Adam. Adam and Eve bought the lie the lie of separation. And once they bought the lie of separation along with it is that God is not good. And they invented their own God and they hid from the invention of their own God in the bushes or in the tree. And they weren't coming out because they now determined what God was like and had to be like and how God worked. And you're not coming in here because now we have tarred your face with the brush of our own infidelity. We have created a God in the image of our own brokenness and we're scared to death and we're not coming out. We're not going to come out of the bushes. So what does the Lord do? Well, he clothes them. And we read that as God can't look at it. So he killed an animal and kind of backed up and clothed them. But what it really is, is a beautiful, stunning picture of the incarnation, you're not going to perish in my creation. I didn't create you to perish, not on our watch. We created you to walk with us and be face to face and not ashamed of yourself. And that's, this is the first picture of, of God, the father clothing Adam and Eve with those animal skins is the first picture of Jesus saying, I'm going to go in father. And I'm going to make you known that I will lift their face. I will lift their face and they will see you with my eyes because here's the point. I'm going to get inside their delusion. I'm not a prophet who speaks the word of God and hopes the people will listen. 
I am the word of God. And I'm going to incarnate myself not only in their humanity, but inside their delusion. And when I get inside their delusion, we're going to have a, a new conversation because I am determined. I will make you known, Father, for my brothers and sisters will not exist in my creation and not know you. And not only not know you, but invent a different God that scares the crap out of them and then invent religions to go with that fear that doesn't heal them. It's all a pose. It's all pretend. I'm going in. And the father says, son, you know, I don't do abandonment. I have your back. I'm in you. Where was God when Jesus was on the cross? God was in Christ, reconciling the cosmos to himself. Where was the Holy Spirit? Was the Holy Spirit standing over on the side with a box of Kleenex? The Holy Spirit anointed Jesus. The Holy Spirit is in Jesus as he makes his sojourn into our delusion. That's the truth that Jesus says that will set you free. When you see that Jesus and in him, the father and in him, the Holy Spirit has come and found a way inside our delusion and the lights are going on on the inside with you and your, your heart, your your knowing of the soul is tapping on the bottom of your mind saying, hello, hello, look at all this mess you believe, but you got to, you got to open up. You got to listen to me. You got to pay attention to the, your soul, your heart and, and reconstruct your mind to go with it. Allow Jesus to transform your vision of his father. Because the one thing, I mean, one of the things Jesus says explicitly in, in uh, Matthew's gospel, no one knows the father but the son. I don't care, Baxter, how many degrees you have in theology. My verdict is you don't know my father. And I'm not passive about it. I am in. And I'm determined that you're going to come to know him. But for you to come to know him, you have to learn to take sides with me because I do know him. I am in him and he's in me. You can't get any closer to the father than I am. And always have been. And I've got inside knowledge and I'm going to share it with you and I'm going to get inside. So big picture. The, the picture of the Bible is the, is the greatest love story ever even conceived. And we in our darkness and delusion have turned this story as my friend, uh, Bruce Walkup in Adelaide, Australia loves to say, we have turned the, the most beautiful love story in history or in, the cosmos into a nightmare because we have painted this picture of God and we're not wanted. We're not loved. Jesus, you go fix the mess if you want to, but I don't care. I don't want it, but we get to go to heaven and hide behind Jesus. This is not the gospel. The gospel is the father's eternal son who is face to face with him from all eternity, anointed in the Holy spirit, became a human being advent. He entered into our world of delusion and got to the very, very bottom. And he brought his father and the Holy spirit with him. And it's all about turning the lights on from the inside out. Now that will bring healing. It's not instant. I wish it was. I mean, I I've been angry with the, <laughs> get on with it, you know? And he's like, well, I am getting on with it. Well, what you called 60, 70, 80 years back, there's nothing. What I, what I'm after is I don't want any darkness in you. I don't want any hint of shadow. I want to see my faithfulness flowing out of you. And I know how to get you there and I'm going to do it. So let's just take that picture in. I know that it may be something that you haven't heard. Um, it is the early church's gospel. It is what's going on in the new Testament in Paul and in John. Um, and people can argue about different things, but I, I'm not interested in theological argument. I'm bearing witness to what I know is the truth. And you ask Jesus Christ, Jesus, is, is this true? Are you taking responsibility for me to make me, me your father known to me in the Holy spirit? Uh, okay. I'm just going to sit down and be quiet for a while, Jesus, because I don't want to see things the way that I see them anymore. I don't want to interpret my wife. I don't want to interpret history. I don't want to interpret my own life. I don't want to interpret what's going on around me the way I see them anymore, Jesus. 
I want to see with your eyes. I want to feel with your heart. I want to share your vision and your communion with your father. I want to live in the Holy Spirit. I don't know how to do that. You do. So take me. And he always says, but I've had you the whole time, Baxter. He had, he said you the whole time. So I've got a diagram that I want to go to um, and help process some of this, but that's where we're headed. This morning, we're headed to the bottom of the abyss of your soul and mine in order that we can discover Jesus there with his father and the Holy spirit. Now, so in order to get there, I want us to, to process a little bit. So, um, we may not, um, just hang on with me because, because, um, in order for us to, um, share in Jesus's life, we have to give up our interpretation of our own. And that's not easy. It takes time. So if you've got the diagrams ready to go, the first one would be great. We could put that up. The soul diagram. Hey, Baxter, give, hey, us, a minute. give us a minute, okay? We just have that um, diagram. Okay. We're going to upload it, okay? Okay, thank you. Um, while, while they're doing that, I want to talk about the, the nativity scene that you probably never heard about. It's not in the four gospels. It's not shepherds and wise men and baby Jesus in a manger. Uh, it's from the book of Revelation. And it's in chapter 12. And I just want to read a couple of verses to you. Chapter 12, verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns on his head and seven diadems and his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And she gave birth to a son, a male child who is to rule the nations with the rod of iron. I think that the rod of iron, this is really interesting. Uh, we don't have time to go into this, but I think that the rod of iron that Jesus rules with is his presence inside our darkness. He won't go away. And we can't pose. Uh, the light shines and exposes the darkness and we cannot kill him again. Anyway, uh, who was to rule the nation with the rod of iron and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Um, the strategy of the evil, of the evil one is to devour. And he devours by blinding us, deceiving us. He deceives us about uh, God's relationship with us and our relationship with God. And he whispers one, essentially one lie, and that is the lie of separation. You are separated from God. So <clears throat> I think this picture of the, the dragon, uh, the serpent, Ophis, if you've read Patmos, um, my book, Patmos, um, this is telling us how he operates. He's waiting for us to be born. And the minute we are born, he hides himself in the shadows of our lives. And he's waiting for a wound. He's waiting for a wound to happen, a hurt, something to happen to you that may not be in the whole scheme of things that big a deal, but it is to you, or it may be a horrendous thing, but he's waiting until the hurt happens and we feel it. And then he whispers and he whispers, I am not to us. And we hear it. And of course he's a coward. That's why he preys on children. Um, we don't know the difference between his voice and our own voice or the voice of, of Jesus, but we hear, I am not. I had a friend, Ken, who was, um, 
he's graduating now to the cloud of witnesses. But in this very room, for 10 years, we met every Tuesday morning with two other men and talked about life, talked about the gospel, talked about all the things that we're talking about right now. Um, and, and one day, Ken, we, just the two of us were talking, and he said, I want to tell you something. He's 80 years old, at then 75 years old at the time. Um, and I noticed his hands were trembling. He said, Baxter, when I was five years old, my dad was plowing in the field behind our house, behind a mule. And he whistled to my mother and he did like this, which meant bring him some tape because he'd worn the gloves, you know, holes in the gloves and he was getting blisters. So he thought at five years old, he said, I thought I can get tape. I can at least do that for my dad. So he ran to the barn, got some tape and tore off a piece about that long. And he said, by the time I got under the fence and got out to my dad, that, that strip of tape was just a ball with dirt and everything else, just a ball of wad. And he said to me, he said, Baxter, he said, my dad looked at me with pure disgust. He put his hand on my head, spun me around, kicked me in the ass and knocked me on the ground. And he said, I peed in my pants and I crawled under that gate and I went, went home. And he's telling me this story and he's still shaking 70 years later, still shaking. And I got to see in the process of conversations in the Holy Spirit work to where Ken got to wipe the face of his father off the face of God. And he got to see the father with Jesus's eyes. The most beautiful, simple, astounding thing happened in that. But that, that moment in his life at five years old, and I'm sure there was more moments than just that. That was probably the exclamation point of a series of events but that devastated his inner world and the evil one is right there to whisper. I am not good enough. I am not loved. And if you believe that you're not good enough and you're not loved, you launch. I, you hatch a plan, but I can be if I can do or be, or, and we'll come back to this uh, in just a moment. I am not good enough. I am not special. I'm not loved. That's a simple picture of the wound. Wound. Um, all of you, I think, probably know Paul Young, um, author of The Shack and Lies We Believe About God and numerous other things. And you may know about his story that he was born on the mission field in, in New Guinea. And by the age of four years old, he began to experience sexual abuse in the tribe. His own father, earthly father, was very angry and took out his anger on Paul. When he turned six, he had to be shipped off away from his parents, away from the only world that he had known to a boarding school. And there the sexual abuse continued. These things absolutely devastate. The evil one is right there waiting for that, whispering, I am not good. This is my fault. If you were good, these things wouldn't be happening to you. Hammering away, whispering, I am not loved. I'm not lovable. I'm not acceptable. I'm not good enough. I'm not going to make it. And so you look at Paul Young's life. And so for the next 40 years, he launches. I can be good. I can be acceptable, can be special if I get to do this. And in his world of religion, then if you really are special, you're going to be, you know, in full-time Christian ministry. <laughs> uh, the only one person in full-time ministry, that's Jesus. The rest of us are participating. All of us are in his work. Um, anyway, so Paul climbs the ladder. He gets to the top. He gets to the place to where, you know, he's now a rising star in that world. And because it was not real, and this is no slight to Paul, it's just an example of us all. Uh, because it's not real, it just falls apart. And he ended up getting in trouble, um, had an affair, 
you probably heard Paul tell the story, just go YouTube. Um, and his whole world came apart. And he came down um, to the place to where he said, there was nothing left of me. He said, I stood on the edge of the abyss and I felt like there was nothing left of me, but I was simply a dried up piece of crap, little piece. And he said, I felt that at any moment, the least wind would come and blow me away forever. You see, that's the way the wound bears fruit in our lives. Now, Paul had rededicated himself to Jesus 50 times. He had practiced all the things that he was told by the preachers to do. But it doesn't change the fact that he felt inside like he was nothing more than a piece of scuba. But the most beautiful, wonderful amazing thing happened is in that moment where he was in that place at the bottom of his own abyss, he met the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they began to tell, to teach him how they saw him. And he began to listen. And the fruit of that is this astounding book, uh, The Shack, where he is determined. He didn't write the book to be published. He wrote the book as a story for his kids because he didn't want his children trapped in the religious non-answer to the real crisis. He wanted them to know that the Father, Son, and Spirit meet us in our abyss. That's the solution. But you see, the evil one is there whispering. I am not. I'm not good enough. I'm not special. Uh, I'm not loved. I'm not lovable. Uh, for me, um, and usually we have a family of the I am not. So I want you to ask yourself the question. Um, well, I can promise you this. If you will ask the question of Jesus, would you show me my I am nots? You will grow. I'm not talking about your marriage. I'm not talking about your husband or your wife or your children or your problems. I'm talking only about us as individuals. If I want to grow, I can ask Jesus, what are my I am not? And I can get out a piece of paper, or really, I, I needed a notebook when I started the process, um, and write down what you hear. One of, one of the ones in my journey was that um, the day that I got my, uh, the, um, my um, PhD in theology from the University of Aberdeen under J.B. Torrance, my grandmother called me from Mississippi. We were in Scotland. She said, Baxter, when you come home this summer, I want you to bring your degree because I want to hold it in my hand. I said, okay. And I did. Now, my grandmother at, on my mother's side, there our backyards met. And she could look out the kitchen at our backyard, see all us boys playing. Anyway, so I took my degree down there to her and I unrolled it. She held it in her hands and she started crying. And she said, this is one of the happiest days of my life. And I said, well, grandmother, I said, there's no way in the world I could have ever done anything like this without you. Because she loved education. And she was always sacrificing and doing whatever we wanted to go for in terms of education. She was all in. And uh, she said, I want to show you something. So we get up from the couch, walk into the kitchen, and look out the window at, at what we call the old house, which was where I was growing up, which was the house that she grew up in. Um, and but on the back side of the house was two steps that came down out of the out of the carport. We were standing in her kitchen looking underneath the big magnolia tree and see these two steps. She said, when you were a little boy, you used to sit on those steps by yourself, sometimes for hours. I said, I don't remember that. She said, well, yeah, you did. And she said, one day I just decided I had to figure out what you were thinking about. So I walked up the sidewalk and sat down beside you and we talked and she said do you remember that i said no i don't remember that at all and she said well we talked a little while and i finally stood up and i said bless his heart he's just dumb every family has one we're just gonna have to take care of it I, I don't remember that moment, but I remember feeling dumb, not smart, not gifted, 
all of my all of my young life. And my grandmother would never ever say anything that would hurt me. And I don't think that was the wound. I think the wound had already been sounded, and that's why I didn't even hear. Um, but think about this. If you are evil and your job is to destroy and to kill and devour, then you are going to attack the very place that is to be a strength in your life. And in my case, I had no idea at the time what God was calling me to. And the last thing I thought in the universe was to be a theologian and a teacher and maybe even a preacher. But I know this, if you're going to destroy that process, you convince the kid that he's dumb. Because the last thing he's going to do is stand up to anybody because he doesn't believe he's smart. And Jesus, over time, in my journey, finally got me to the place to where he says to me one day, he said, Baxter, he said, am I, am I dumb? So, oh, Jesus. No, 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 no. You, I don't need to tell you that. He said, well, um, I have given you my mind. Use it. Be done with this. I am dumb stuff. So, but that wound was very real and almost sidetracked me completely, but in and with and through my own little delusional checkerboard, the Holy Spirit's doing the three-dimensional kingdom chess game and the Lord is leading me all along. The same is true of you. You may not be able to see it yet, but as you look back, you'll see that there's a lot more going on in your life than just what you think is do you're doing or is happening. That was one of the wounds in my own journey recently this year. I was talking to a friend of mine on Zoom. Um, this uh, friend, Nan, uh, is one of, of all the people that I've met all over the world. She has the most remarkable, simple relationship with the Father, Son, Spirit of anybody I've ever met. And now, but she's been through hell to get there. Um, but we were talking and she says, well, how are you doing? What's going on? And, you know, usually we respond most time i'm doing great everything's great how you doing how's your family then you know but it just i thought this is nan i mean we we talk for real and uh, i said well i said to be perfectly honest uh at this moment in my life i'm sore in the heights uh teaching and uh zooming and doing all the things that are just to me uh, amazing but there's a part of me that just wants to check out it just wants to go, to go away. And so I said, I, you know, I, I know that I feel it. I've asked Jesus about it. And then, you know, uh, and if you met her and you will one day, I mean, she's not an aggressive type person at all, but she just looks right through the camera and says, you want to talk about that? I said, well, sure. And we started talking about it. And then she said, well, you, would you like to pray? And I said, well, yeah. She said, well, let's ask Jesus. So we did. Next thing I know, I'm seeing this picture, uh, more than a picture, it's a video. And I see a, a pulsating organ. I'm not sure what it is, but it's pulsating. Then I realize that it's, it's my mother's womb, surrounded completely by purple, beautiful purple. And I'm like, I, I, she said, just ask Jesus, and I did. And she said, do you know what this is? And I said, yeah, I know what it is. This is my mother's womb. And I'm on the inside looking out. And she said, well, what are you feeling? She said, don't go off in your theological head. Just, just stay in there with your feelings. I said, well, I said, I'm feeling unwanted. And she said, ask Jesus about that. And I did. And she said, what's the significance of the purple? I said, I know what this is, Nan. Now, mind you, I am in a pile of tears. I said, the purple is Jesus. And he's saying to me, Baxter, it's true. You were unwanted at that moment. But I wanted you. And you're here because I wanted you. So I'm like, okay. You know, I was unaware for 60 
21 years of my life consciously of that wound. Now, I don't mean to say, I mean, I don't remember that in terms of my childhood, but I knew it was true. And I don't know what was going on with my mom and dad. It's like anything else. They could have had a bad hair day. Um, I don't know. Um, but that's not the message that I received from them from my life, but that's what I believed from my mother's womb. And this is the way Jesus meets us and brings healing to us. And we face our, I am nots. And all of a sudden we, they get, I am, we hear his, I am over and above our, I am nots. And that's the only thing that can trump, um, the only thing that can trump the, I am not. So, um, the wounds are real. The evil one waits, um, ask Jesus to show you, uh, what, what, you know, the wound is ask him to show you how the, I am not have been attached to that. And what we do with that, the minute we hear the whisper, I am not special. I'm not good enough. I'm not going to make it. I'm not smart. I'm not wanted. I'm not loved. I'm not lovable. I'm not special. And one in one of the conferences I did years ago, this woman stands up and she says, I want to share something with y'all. And she said, when I was a young girl, my, my, uh, my father and his brother sexually abused me. And this woman just stands up and says this, a live conference. And she said, and it was devastating. But she said that wasn't the real wound. The real wound was that my mother knew about it and didn't do anything to stop it. She said, I concluded, I am not worthy of even being protected. You see, it doesn't matter how profound the wound or the trauma is, relatively speaking, compared to other people's journeys. What matters is what it means to us. And the evil one is there to attach his interpretation. Now, I am not is what he feels about himself. And he shares it with us. And we don't know any different and we believe it. And as we believe it, I am not. Let's just go with, I am not lovable. As we believe it, or as we agree to it, because it's a word that doesn't start with us, it comes from without, but it's an interpretation. I am not lovable. Then that's like taking it into your soul or Paul Young would call it the shack, which is your inner, and I like to call it inner world. But you, be, you begin to believe inside of your own soul that you're not lovable. You're not good enough. You're not special. You're not worthy of being cared for. But just play that forward a little bit. Imagine that you get married. And let's say, for example, that you, you pour yourself out for your husband, but he believes he's not worthy. So he's going to misread you're pouring yourself out for him is whatever else that is. It can't be real because I'm unworthy. And after a while, you know, you just kind of give up or flip the picture. Uh, you have a husband that, that adores you. And he, he does stupid stuff like bring you flowers for no reason. It's not Valentine's. It's not the standard day we're supposed to do. He just brings you flowers. And, and you try to be nice. Thank you very much. But you don't believe you're worthy. So that cannot be a real gift. So there has to be an ulterior motive. So you see, in two seconds flat, we have any, it's just not conscious. We're not processing it. We're not thinking. It just happens. We respond because of the way we perceive ourselves, because of the wound and the way this plays out in our relationships without us even thinking. Well, I can tell you, man, after a couple of years of that, you're not going to get any flowers anymore. I mean, it's just like, you hand somebody flowers and the, the message is that's not real. Therefore you're not real. You don't really love me. And this, these dynamics begin to play out rather quickly. Um, and usually what happens in for many people is after three, four, five years or six years of that, we just walk away. And then we re up and do the same thing all over again, because the wound, neither one of our wounds have been addressed and healed. And we end up getting married again and we get married again, which 
lo and behold, we're in the same dynamic. Um, so you got the wound, you got the whisper of evil, the I am not, we believe it, it goes inside of our own souls and it produces a fruit, uh, guilt, shame. And my friend, Katie Scourger, who is a counselor in Oregon, she defines shame as I am not good enough. Uh, that of course produces anxiety and that or angst, which is deeper than anxiety. It, it won't let you sleep. It won't let you be present. And to me, the probably more important than uh, was right there beside, I am not good enough. Uh, I'm not enough is fear. Now let's just say, for example, now let me give you an example from my own life. Uh, years ago now, I'm driving down the road, coming home. I'm in a Honda Accord that was donated to our ministry. And I was thrilled because it had air conditioning. And, you know, like living in Miami, I mean, Mississippi is not, not a cold spot. Um, I was just thrilled. I was sitting at the red light by myself in my little cord with air conditioning. And I was one mile from my house. And this lady pulls up beside me in, I think, like a, a really nice Mercedes. And she's going to turn left. And I remember just standing there minding my own business, you know. And she looked over at me and she just rolled her eyes like and turned left. And off the tapes go, the, the wounds, all the stuff's going on inside of me. But basically, it created fear that I was never going to make it. If you were half a man, you would have a three-car garage and you'd have blah, 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 blah. In less than one mile, my inner world was a complete mess. I became afraid and fear instantly makes us self-centered. Instantly. When you're afraid, you're focused on yourself. So I walk into my house, my wife, Beth, three kids. My three kids are watching television. Beth is talking on the phone, cooking supper. I walk in, nobody pays any attention to me. Which is not a big deal normally, but it was a big deal at this moment because I had become afraid. I was focused on myself. And so now look at what I'm doing to my family. Now they're there not for me to pour out life to them. They're there to solve the riddle of my soul that I'm unconscious of. And I get angry. And I got in my car and left. And I drove around for about 20 more minutes, pulled it back in, walked in. Beth looks at me and she says, what's wrong? <laughs> like nothing. <laughs> you see, I want to be a fountain, not a vacuum cleaner. I could have put Bible verses on it. I could have quoted scripture. I could have done the pose. I'm just fine. How are you? But the truth is there's this mess flowing out of me, which is fear, shame, guilt. It's like an invisible river. It's, it's not the river of living water that Jesus promised. It's a river of toxic waste. And it's flowing out on my family. Now, two days later, my son, I get a call. He's in trouble at school. It's like in the fourth grade or something. Um, he, he didn't ever get in trouble at school. Not that he, he shouldn't have, but th they just said he just seems overly aggressive. And I thought, that's my fear thrown up on my family coming out sideways in my son at school. That's what that is. Well, how do you get rid of fear? How do you get rid of being self-centered? How do you deal with that? So these are, you're tracking with me. We're, we're young. We get hurt. The evil one whispers, I am not special, good, loved, and not important, not worthy. We believe it. It produces a fruit inside of our soul. Fear, anxiety, angst, um, indifference, sense of loss. And for me, one of the big ones was insecurity. I'm not going to make it. It's up to me. I got to make this happen. Uh, again, focus completely on myself.
And that flows out as a river of toxic waste. Um, for those of you that like to cook, you, you all know what a roux is, especially those of us that like Cajun cooking. Uh, but you just take some oil or butter and flour and put it in a cast iron skillet and start stirring it. And you can have a light brown, a light blonde roux or a medium, or if you're making gumbo, a dark brown roux. And then you've got, <laughs> this is the truth, the, what the um, Cajuns call the holy trinity of Cajun cooking, bell pepper, onion, and celery. So then you put that in there and then you pour in the stock um shrimp stock or some seafood stock and stir it all up together and so that becomes the roux with the the, the um the spices i mean the the um the holy trinity so that then whatever you put in that pot is going to be flavored with the roux so the roux is going to permeate the dish that and that's exactly what happens in our journey Whatever's going on in our inner world is a rue that is permeating the dish of our lives from us out. Again, I'm not talking about our wives or husbands or anything. I'm talking about us. Whatever is going on in your inner world permeates the dish of your life, of your relationships. Now, this is just the way it is. It's automatic. It's just the way we're designed. Uh, we're designed uh, in the image of the Trinity, which means a permeating of relationships, a oneness. Um, so um, permeating the dish of our lives uh, in that rue of guilt, shame, not enough, anxiety, insecurity, fear, dread, loss, that rue permeates the dish of our relationships. Uh, it's a river of toxic waste. Now this, these are, um, these things, this reality, the wounds, the whisper, the interpretation, the belief, the root created, uh, the river of toxic waste, they become drivers in our lives, the things that drive us. Um, I am not important. The first driver is self-salvation. I am not important, but I can be. If I can get or be this. So then you just write a line and fill out what is it that I'm trying to become? What is it that I have believed that is outside of myself that I think will complete me, make me whole, save me, make me important, make me good enough, make me special, make me lovable. Most of us, I think uh, this is why we get married. Uh, two reasons. One is I think that in, in most cases there's a genuine mutual affection and desire, and we're attracted to one another, and we want to be with one another, and that's beautiful and good and right. But there's also the invisibles, the wound driving. I can be. I'm not special. I'm not loved. I'm not uh, important. I'm not beautiful. Um, I'm not smart, but I can be if I get married. So now what's going on is that we're actually turning to our husband or our wife to fix the problem of our soul that we don't even know about. And it's driving. And I can speak from my own experience on this one that I have spent years trying to manipulate my wife to be the best that I think she needs to be to save me. And I'm not aware of the fact that I need to be saved. It's what we do. It's not enough for her to be who she is. I've got to have her be this best. And there's a lot riding on this. And so that drives and the manip manipulation, of course, she's doing the same thing. We're doing the same thing to each other. I'm not special, but I can be if you will look this way or if you will do this or if, you know, and we're just putting pressure. If our children, I mean, for Pete's sake, how scary is it to go to a soccer match with our children or a baseball game and see the intensity of the parents? All that is, and I want you to think about this, 
I did this. I coached little league baseball for my son when he was young. And one game, now it was nine years old kids, boys. I don't remember what happened, but I got angry and I threw my hat on the ground. And my wife was sitting, I was on the first base side. My wife was sitting over third base side and I could feel her staring at me. And I barely was able to look up and I, she just had this horrified look on her face. Like what the hell Baxter, they're nine years old. And I realized in that moment, it wasn't about them playing. I wanted them to justify my superiority by their good works on the baseball field. That's where the anger is coming from. It's coming from us. I'm not special, but I can be if my child will perform. And so but there we are putting pressure on them and they're not free to be kids and just play baseball. They've got to win and not just win. They got to win convincingly or they got to be the best or whatever there is a beauty pageant or grades, or uh, maybe they're musicians and we want them to be a football star. I hope this is making some sense to you, but this is the way it works. This is why religion doesn't solve the problem. Because then after I'm doing this to my kids on the baseball field, the next day we go to church and everybody's dressed up and we're all posing. How you doing? I'm just fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> it's like, it's a charade. It's a hologram. It's difficult to face, but Jesus says, man, as you face this, I'm going to set you free. You're going to be the best baseball coach in the whole world because you're not going to be putting pressure on your kids for your benefit. You're actually going to be able to pour yourself out as a river for them for their benefit. Now watch them play baseball in that. Watch them go to school in that. Watch them free to say, I'm, I'm going to let you get into music. How can I help you? Music's not my thing, but this is your thing. How can I help? Because I, I'm not trying to get you to be something for me. I'm trying to see who you are in Jesus and, and, and nurture that. That's a huge, huge thing. We put so much pressure on our spouses and on our children and really on our group because of what's going on in our inner world. That's the river of toxic waste. First, first driver. I, I am not, but I can be if I can get this. That my friends, is the origin of denominations. I am not special, but I can be if I get to be a big pastor with a big church. Then it proves to everybody that God's blessing is on me because I got size matters. That's not Jesus. That's our darkness. We're going to create this thing. Now we've got to defend it and not only defend it, but get just now we have to prove that we are superior and we're right. So now I'm going to point my finger at every one of you and your different denominations. And it's my job to prove that you're all wrong and we're right. Like this. That's not how this works. I'm not special, but I can be if I get a degree. I'm not just a degree, but a theology degree, not just a theology degree but a PhD, not just a PhD, but a PhD from one of the best universities in the world drives. Now, all along the way in our checker game, the Holy Spirit's doing all kinds of wonderful, beautiful things that we're not necessarily aware of because this is not, this is not just a wounded life. This is a wounded life in the arms of the Father, Son, and Spirit who are redeeming geniuses, who are always bringing life and goodness out of these situations that we are creating in our darkness. Never alone. Not for one minute does this whole thing matter about our stitches. We have a master corporate we are at work in our lives. I'm outlining the dynamic of what we do. Um, this all started in the Garden of Eden with the whisper of evil one getting them to doubt. Now get this. God knows that when you eat of that tree, you will be, you will, you will become like God. Wait a minute. What do you mean become like God? I'm already like God. I was created in God's image and likeness. That's the original. I am not, I'm not there yet. I'm not like God. I'm not special, but I can be. And off he goes. And so all Adam is going to do is create an illusion of how he can make himself divine 
or how he can make him give himself life. Quick illustration in our country right now, two major powers at work. I'm not talking about left and right, two major powers. One is religion. Religion is what we do when we don't know that Jesus is inside of us and he brought his father and soul, his Holy Spirit with him. It's what we do to create life, to honor Jesus. And we, we lay it all out. This is what the kingdom looks like. This is the way we're supposed to look. This is what we're supposed to do. And we go and do it. And the preacher told us to, he got a Bible verse to prove it. So off we go inside. We're still dying, but we're looking apart. Blessedly, that whole charade is falling apart before our eyes. The other big power in our country is what we would call humanism or secular humanism. And this is Luke 15, the two sons, the younger son, father, I want to share this state that belongs to me. I am going to go create life on my own terms without reference to my father, without reference to God, without reference to Jesus. We are going to create life on our own terms. And off we go living out our theories. And now these theories have been written large into human history and involve the entire nation, which happens to be the most powerful nation, at least for the moment, on earth. And in the midst of our nation, we have these two buying things. One is, no, our creation of life in, in the name of Jesus is right. No, we don't need all that. We just need this. Both, both are wrong. I have come that you may have life and may have it abundantly. You shall know the truth, religious people, and the truth shall set you free. Humanist, I am the light of the cosmos. You were created in me. You will never find life anywhere but in me. Go live out your theory. Religious people, go build your empire for a distant, distant Jesus. Has nothing to do with the real world of the Father, Son, and Spirit. But we can spend, I have spent uh, decades decades trying to work that program and create the life i am not special i can be if i can get that job but rosemary is up for that job and so is john so i will destroy them one way or another, by whispers, by whatever, because I have to have that job. If I don't get that job, I'm going to have to live with the whisper that I'm not special. And I can't bear that. So we slander. We talk bad about each other. We make rumors all so that we can get this position. And all we're doing is trying to save ourselves. Um, Jesus says, let Rosemary have it. I got something better for you. Walk with me. See what I see. He'll set you free from this. I'm not special. I'm not important. I'm not good enough, but I can be if I can live in this part of town or if my children will look a certain way or if I have enough money to buy these things and we become hoarders and we impose. And <laughs> I tell you, think about the man who is strutting to his first class seat, unaware that he's on the wrong plane. It doesn't matter what side of town or what kind of house you live in, or even if you don't live in a house at all. The foxes have holes. The son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Was he homeless? He dwells in the bosom of the Father. We invent these different things because we think I can climb up that ladder. And once I reach that point, then I will become something. Well, I want to tell you that you were created in Jesus Christ by the Father, Son, and Spirit. Your value is from them. They adore you. They love you walk with them, and all of this begins to appear to be nothing other than a big hologram 
It's a hologram that we invest our lives into, mind you. I have, but it's a hologram. It's not real. What's real is Jesus and the fact that he's embraced us in the midst of our darkness and brokenness forever. And he won't ever give up. He just doesn't do it. Father, Son, and Spirit don't do abandonment. So our first response to the lethal to the to the um, lethal ruths percolating inside of us. You got the wound, you got the whisper, you got the agreement on our part creates this river of toxic waste inside of us is driving us to save ourselves. And you come to a place in your journey where you realize, Jesus, I don't know what salvation is. I don't know what life is. I don't know what righteousness, I don't know what goodness is. You do. You're the shepherd. You know where what goodness is. I, I just want to walk with you. I don't want to see things the way I see them anymore. That's the truth beginning to set us free from all our illusions or delusions. In our country, at the moment, uh, it appears as though politics, you know, is power. And people talk about how powerful people are in Washington. People talk about how powerful, you know, these different groups are. That That's not power. Those of you that are young, you will live to see all these people that are powerful dead. They won't be here anymore. This is Jesus's world. He is determined that we walk with him and no life and no freedom and no healing. You cannot get there on your own effort. But this life is the space and time. As George McDonald says, this is the time that God has given us to make fools of ourselves. We get to live out our theories. The dude that believes that he's got it figured out and he's being driven to create an empire, six flags over Jesus for his honor and glory gets to live that out and make a mess of things in order that he will see he doesn't know what he's talking about and become, as McDonald says, then he becomes wise. It's writ large in our culture, and it's writ large in us and individually. You shall know the truth. If you continue in my word, and Jesus is not talking about the New Testament because it wasn't even written there. He's talking about his word. If you continue to listen to me, Baxter, take sides with me, you're going to see something that is that you don't see, three-dimensional Trinitarian chess going on. You're going to, and then you get free from all the, all the illusions, which may not be illusions to you. And believe me, I, I know what it's like when someone who has invested, let's say 60 years proving to his group, his church, or his, that he's got it going on. When all of a sudden he sees the three-dimensional kingdom going on and he's been playing church that releases an awful lot of anger and it needs to be released because it's, it's rooted in, 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 in non-reality, non-truth, non-Jesus. So first thing we do uh, is that um, uh, self-salvation, that, that river of toxic waste that I talked about fear, it makes us self-centered, self-protective hiding. It makes us judgmental comparisons. We're always so well, I'm bad. I'm not as bad as that person. This not, we have this, we, you know, uh, these things are driving us to do something to save ourselves. The second thing there is um, a re second response to that is really medication. Uh, and you that are in recovery know, uh, know these stories and know this, that I'm, I'm not special. It's just too damn unbearable. So what I'm going to do is medicate the pain. And the number one medication in our, in our uh, country is not drugs. This is the number one medicator in our country right here. I'm going to stay so busy on the phone doing important things that I never have to feel the fact that I believe I am not. Thank God for devices like phones, internet, Zoom. But they are electronic pacifiers or can be uh, they can be our number one drug of choice to avoid the pain of facing it. Um, so I'm sitting here in right here one day. 
about five years ago. And um, the Holy Spirit had given me the idea of my book, Patmos. So I came over to my office and I pulled out my computer and I typed up what amounted to be three uh, chapter, first three chapters. Um, and I stood up right here and I said, Holy Spirit, you're being rude to me. And I could feel the Holy Spirit with me and looking at me like a hand. I said, why would you give to me an extraordinary idea of a burned out suicidal theologian from the matrix, time traveling, and meeting the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos and spending three days and three nights with him. Why would you give me that idea when you know I cannot write like that? Because I'm not smart. See, And I'm on my own. I'm separated. And I, this is all you get. And I can't do that. And the Holy Spirit says, Baxter, I'm smart. Why don't we do this together? And I said, for real. You're not going to, you're going to walk with me for six chapters and then walk away and leave me all up to my devices. And we're going to end up with some cheesy Christianese book with a half an insight on page 95. And the Holy Spirit says, Baxter, I am not the one who leaves. L-E-A-V-E-S. I'm like, oh. and I have come with Jesus and the Father, and we have embraced you at your worst, in your abyss, in your darkness, and we're never leaving. You are the one who leaves your own heart. You go out from your heart and pour yourself into noble things or anything outside because it's painful in here it's painful because we are light and there's darkness inside of you and the light exposes the darkness and that does not feel good so you just go medicate and you can medicate by being religious or being on the phone or taking drugs or staying so busy that you never have time to feel. But Baxter, just know this, anytime you want to come back to your own heart, I will be here with all of my infinite creativity. So I'm like, okay, I'm here. And I'm not getting up until we get the glory. And off we went. And it, that book developed in ways that I had no, I didn't see any of that coming. But that's what happens is it's hot. It's hot inside your own heart because of the, of the wound, because of the interpretation, because of the pain, because of the things that we actually have done or been done to us. And the light shines in there and it exposes darkness is darkness. And who wants to be exposed? Um, I had this guy that I knew, you know, years ago. Um, if you would have asked anybody in his church who was the godliest person they've ever known, everybody would have voted for that guy without, without any question. And he thought he got himself into this. He thought he was smart enough to pray the prayer to get in Jesus and the rest of us buffoons were just lagging behind. Imagine how angry he got when he realized that he'd been in, he, had been, he was born in Jesus. This is never about him figuring out how to get in. This is always about Jesus being his brother, determined that he comes to see his father with Jesus' eyes. And he realized that he didn't make this happen. There was a great voluminous anger came out of that man because his whole facade was exposed as being nothing other than a hologram. Didn't mean that the Father, Son, and Spirit weren't in the middle of the hologram doing all kinds of good things through him or through you or through me. Um, medication... Um, could be Christmas shopping. 
It could be dating. It could be fishing. Or making fishing lures. But that doesn't mean that the Father, Son, and Spirit are not in and with all of that, redeeming and making good things happen in our lives. Um, so these drivers from the wound, and I am not in a whisper, and the fear and the anxiety driving us to save ourselves, driving us to medicate. And there's a whole list of things that we could go through here, but I just want to identify five. Um, first one is self-salvation. I'm not good, but I can be if I, hey, that's me. I'm going to make this happen. The other is medication. I'm, I'm not worthy, and it's just freaking unbearable in here. So I'm just going to stay busy. I'm going to stay drunk or I'm going to stay one form of, of um, um, medicating so I don't feel that pain. The third um, way we respond is denial, which is closely related to blame. What do you mean I'm not special? Of course I'm special. I'm the most special person in the room. Don't you see that? How can you think that? I don't have a problem. What problem? That's all, it's your fault. Uh, the problems in this in this marriage are not mine. They're yours. You're the one that brought all this in. And, you know, denial. Uh, finding ways to blame others and, and not take responsibility. But, and the reason we don't take responsibility for ourselves is because we don't believe there's a real answer in us. We know we're not good enough. So how in the world are we going to look inside? Because all we're going to find is irrefutable proof that that's the truth. So I don't have a problem. I'm fine. You could go through three, four marriages and still be blaming everybody in the universe for the problems that's going on. Denial, as the old song said, is not a river in Egypt. It's what we do. We're in denial about our issues because we don't believe we have a solution and there is a solution and his name is Jesus. And we don't have to be in denial. We can square off with all of our demons. We can square off with all of our hidden secrets. We can square off with all of that and say, yes, yes, this is true. I did that. I do this. I, yes, Jesus, because you meet Jesus underneath all of that. He has gone to the bottom of our abyss and he brought his father, the Holy Spirit with him. I think of the soul, um, our inner world, as I said, and there's a, a garbage can over on the right side and the bottom. And that's where we keep all our secrets. That's where we keep all our stuff that we don't want anybody to know. We don't want to face um, the things that make us ashamed, et cetera, the things that happen to us, they're all there. And so we just spend an enormous amount of our emotional energy every day trying to keep, keep um, that lid down um, um, and so we're not going to look in there because if we look inside a garbage can, we're going to find irrefu irrefutable proof that we are not worthy. And now we know we're not worthy and we're standing before God and we're not going there. So I'm just going to pretend this is not so, but when you're ready, I encourage you to lift the lid and look inside, dive in. Because you know what you find at the bottom of your garbage can where you have shoveled all of your scuba and all of your shame and all of your pain over in the bottom of that. And keep what you find at the bottom of that is the Father, Son, Spirit. They have embraced us at our very worst forever. We don't have to be in denial. We, and that's one of the hallmarks to me of, of real uh, righteousness, ironically. Real, the home or the manifestation of real righteousness in a person's life is not that they bought into somebody's definition of what righteousness looks like and then go and do it. The form, real righteousness, is when you look in the garbage can and you just say, I did that. That's me. I did it. And then you begin to see that there is a right relationship forming in you by virtue of your confession, there is a real a right relationship, which is what righteousness means, forming in you from your innermost being. 
a right relationship with God the Father doesn't mean that you're perfect. It means that you acknowledge what's real. And he's got you right there. That is a right relationship. I tell people um, that we were never meant to be perfect. We were never meant to be righteous. We were never meant to be good. We were created to share in their goodness. We're created to share in their right relationship. They are the perfecting ones and they perfect us by embracing our imperfections. Or to put this more strongly, they embrace us by accepting us as sinners, as broken. And they begin to work to unbreak and to lead us. And we begin to participate in their way of being, their way of goodness, their way of life, which is the kingdom. Um, a fourth uh, way we respond to all of this um, is what I call fix me. Or you could call this codependence to use one of the words. Um, I'm not special. I'm not good enough. I'm not important. I'm not smart. I'm not worthy. And it's your job to make me feel as though I am. So we assign to people around us outside of ourselves the responsibility to make us feel a certain way about ourselves. And then we spend our lives manipulating them, trying to get them to do it the way we think they need to do it. So it'll make us feel a certain way. And it never works. I can tell you. Um, I have one of the best degrees in the world. It doesn't mean anything to me. It doesn't have the power to touch my brokenness. It doesn't confer anything on me. What means something to me is to meet Jesus in my brokenness. Because now I know that the eternal word of God likes me. And the me that he likes is not the posing me. It's not the one who, who, Bought, bought into the preacher's you know, ideas of what perfection looks like and is doing a good job of fooling everybody. That No, the me that Jesus has embraced is the broken me. He's made his way into the abyss. When I meet him there, he brought his father with him. When I meet him and Jesus lifts my face, that means something. That's the word of God speaking to my soul that that's the I am that overcomes the I am not. And re and reconfigures the inner world. Um, assigning people responsibility for fixing us puts pressure on them, and there's plenty of us types that 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 thrive on that because that then feeds back into the leaderships. I am not I'm not special, but yeah, I am because all these people need me. Now, I I literally watched the senior pastor one time uh, keep his elders and leaders sick so that they would need him. And that went on for years. I wonder how widespread that is. But a healthy person who's functioning not from I am not, but from Jesus as I am, that pastor is gonna set his people free so that he's not needed. And then it becomes an adult relationship where you're not needed, you want it. Quantania happens then. But we assign uh, people around us, usually our marriage, it's, this is the pressure that we put on our spouses um, to fix me. And we're unconscious of the fact that we're even broken. We're still in denial about it. All these are not stages, by the way, these are all mixed in together. I'm just sort of pulling them apart from my own experience and trying to highlight them, all of which is to paint a picture so that we can then see the gospel. So we can then see what Advent's about. We can then see what it means that we have a good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep to enter into our delusion, to liberate us from it, so that the river of living water can flow out of our innermost being into the lives of all those around us. And it is. And one of the things I want you to do uh, as a result of these uh, this morning's conversation is I want you to write this question, two questions down. Number one, 
Jesus, show me how I am already a river of living water. Put that another way. Show me how I am already sharing in your beautiful life with your Father and the Holy Spirit. Because you are. It's impossible to be alive on this earth and not share in the life of the Father, Son, Spirit. It may get twisted, but it's there and it's beautiful and it's expressing itself. It may be that Jesus says, well, you remember last night, 2.30, when so-and-so called you and you took the phone? That was me. That was me and you. Well, you know how you spent all weekend for the last two years pouring yourself out for the kid, your kids, so they could go to this and that, that. That's me. That's what the shepherd does, lays down his life. Oh, you know how um, you cook supper for your buddy. See, we're already participating. We don't give ourselves any credit because we believe we're separated and we're not. So that's question really important. How am I already in this? How am I already sharing in this? And the other question is, Jesus, would you show me how you're in my pain? I, I can't see it. I need to see it. Would you show me how you're in my pain? The answer to that question is yes, Lockie, he sent me a text. <laughs> um, so uh, a fifth uh, way we respond to all this is by creating uh, what I call a confirmation society around us. Uh, our friends that we hang with begin to be nothing other than people who will confirm that we're okay, will help us continue our denial or even our self-salvation schemes. And we gather those around and we're, and there's, there's unstated rules in this. You can't question the system, <laughs> you know, uh, but I'm basically now I've gathered around me three, four, five, six, seven, or a hundred people who will confirm that I'm right, that I'm okay. And they're trying to give me um, the real answer without the real answer. The real answer is not coming from people that we surround ourselves that will confirm us. The real answer is hearing Jesus. Of course, you're okay, Baxter, because I have you. Yes, you're in the dark. Yes, you're making the, I've got you. Now, in the, the John chapter 6, in the, um, when Jesus is going to feed the 5,000 men, probably 20, 25,000 people, um, the first thing he does is he turns to Philip and he says, hey, Philip, he says, well, what are we going to do about this? And Philip's like, Jesus, I mean, a year's salary is not enough money to buy bread for this many people. I don't know. Andrew said, well, there's a, there's a lad over here that has some loaves and a few fish, but I mean, what's that compared to 25,000 people? I mean, and then he launches into this thing where he actually feeds all those people and then he walks on the, the water and the, the whole chapter unfolds and but the lesson of the chapter is right there at the very beginning and the lesson is do not assess a situation as if i am absent and not good philip you assess the situation as if i am not here as the Father's eternal Son, as the one anointed in the Holy Spirit, as the creator and sustainer of all things. You assess the situation without recognizing my presence. Andrew, you did the same thing. That's okay. But I want you to see I'm here. And I'm good. And I'm always redeeming. So you refer back to me, not to the confirmation society. I will confirm you because I will show you how I am here involved in your life with you for good. So do not assess the diagnosis of a doctor or do not assess a financial crisis or do not assess um, problems that you have with your children or your wife or husband or friends as if Jesus is not present. And not just present with you, but in you. And not just Jesus, but his Father and the Holy Spirit. 
and not just the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in some abstract Trinitarian doctrine, but as three persons who not only love one another so deeply they're one, but three persons who uh, redeem all the time. Back to the story I started with about the, the carpet weaver and his, and his granddaughter. I am here, Baxter, and I am working 24 seven to bring life out of chaos, order, life, peace, my peace, my, my wholeness out of the chaos. Now, those are five ways that we respond. I mean, you could do six, which would be control and manipulation, but that kind of really runs through all of them in different ways. But there are ways in which we're trying to solve the problem as if Jesus is not here. Or if he's here, he's here only with the church version of me, <laughs> which is only an hour long. Um, or maybe maybe a couple of hours, depends on if I have committee meetings during the week where I can put the religious pose back on. But by and large, uh, it's the, the religious pose doesn't last very long. Um, this is why it, I, I used to marvel when I was growing up that, you know, my family, my dad's a lawyer, so we were always arguing about stuff, but that wasn't considered a fight uh, or a real argument. That was just banter. But I noticed that every Sunday morning, it was pure hell getting ready to go to church. Um, and I thought about it. I thought, well, what's going on? In, in time, when I had my own kids and same hell on Sunday morning, I realized well, the reason is because our children relate to us as we are during the week. And all of a sudden, Sunday morning, we get dressed up and we pose. We get our Bibles out and we're going to go to church. How you doing? Good to see you fine. I'm just fine. But our kids don't know the game. So they're lollygagging around and they're not joining the pose. Um, and when that pose gets re real, real large, it, it can create even more chaos. But um, so that that is, um, what time is it? Oh my goodness. So how much time do we have? Um, anyway, let uh, th these diagrams will be made, made available. You've got them. Somebody has them. Um, I hope, um, um, but you can see them. Uh, well, we're not done. Can you turn on this mic for me? We're not done, though. No, 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 no. Heck no. I hadn't even gotten going. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> I, I'll be here for as long as you want to. Oh, yeah, till tomorrow, please. <laughs> If I had to get up at six o'clock on a Saturday morning and I wasn't going fishing, I, once I'm up, I'm up. <laughs> so did y'all make notes? Yes. yes. Is it like just me? Yes. Because oh. some of you already to, spoke to me like Jesus and Renato's been texting me and I'm sitting next to George and we're all having this little... The little mine, uh, Vivi. Vivi. We're having these little mine expl. We're having these little mine explosions and heart explosions. Fireworks. And Baxter, you're on fire. I don't know what happened to you in the last two years that I haven't seen you. Before. <laughs> you've grown a lot. I guess you've been healed. Yeah? <laughs> well, I can tell you one thing: is I met Jesus in my mother's womb. That helped. Uh, are you all listening? He met Jesus in his mother's womb this year. Yeah, this year. Are you, you, the ones who came late. No, no shame. Just, <laughs> just stating a fact, right? I, I, I just want to do something for one second. Yeah. Just one second before we just move on to the next thing. I think, I mean, this was not a fire hose. I mean, this was so amazing. There, there was so much, there's so much that he said in the last one and for me, and I've only been doing this for 30 years. For me, he said so much and I'm like, I didn't even want to slow this down. I was like, I but, didn't even know how to take a break. But just, just, I, I just want you to sit there for one second and consciously grasp and receive and let it come in and sink in. Don't just leave it up here at this level. 
because we can hear all this, sounds good, get up, make a joke, move on, and continue the same. And that is what most of us do all the time. I mean, this is life-changing, what Baxter's sharing with us. I mean, I'm hearing him talk in every Everything. cell inside right. of me, every organ. Right. It's moving, right. it's twisting, mm -hmm. it's doing something. Do you know when you have a baby, have you seen them when sometimes you try to Never speak to them? Yeah. But when you- No, 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 not if you have a baby, when, when, when but you when you see a baby. See a baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You hold a baby. Yeah. Yeah. Every time you hold a baby, or even a dog, even, even a dog, Joe. begin to talk to them and all of a sudden it's like, they cannot speak, but you see, you get into them, and yeah. everything inside of them moves their eyebrows. No. They smile. They don't know what to do. Even the dogs begin to do this. <laughs> the ears, you know, something, you know? Yeah. I feel like this. I feel like he's talking, and I feel like my ears, everything's going like, oh my God, oh my God, yes, yes, absolutely. We, we were texting each other. This, this is real for us, you know? We were texting each other, husband and wife, and saying, what is he talking about? It's so... Um, it's clear. It's so good. It's what we talk about all the time at Hope for Life with another perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And said it, saying it so gracefully, so beautiful, so simply. I can tell you one thing, Baxter. The first time we went to pick him up to the airport and I was going to meet him and I realized, oh my goodness, Dr. Baxter, Baxter Kruger and all these letters after his name <laughs> from this university. And, theologian and oh my god I don't even know how it I mean he studied under the Torrance brothers I mean it's it's a you can't it's like and I'm like what am I going to talk to him about hey my name is John <laughs> and when I get nervous I forget English and Spanish so <laughs> and you know it's like we're driving to the airport to pick him up and this is like my insecurities right right the I'm not. My insecurities are all like, oh my God, and how are you supposed to impress a, a person like this? You know, how are you, you know, what am I going to show him? How am I going to show him that him getting on a plane, uh, coming to Miami to this. To somebody he didn't even know. To this place he doesn't know, people he doesn't know. How am I going to know? In one second, as after he gets in the car and we have him trapped there, you know, <laughs> that he has nowhere else to go, how how are we going to impress him and say, you know what, it was worth for you to come here. It was worth for you to come and meet all these people. And I remember I was like so self-conscious. And I can tell you one thing, when these men got in the car, all that disappeared. Because he automatically embraced us, names, accolades, degrees did not matter. He simply came and embraced us and at our, at a, at a level that I could understand. You know, he was not there trying to impress me either on how much he knows and how right he is and how all his, these years of degrees and, and studies. Um, and I, I'm coming here to teach you. He simply came down to my level. Simple language, simple English, and he did it. And I'm sitting here today, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, he's doing it again mm. for all of us. Right. He's coming down to our level, our language, at a level that we can all connect, which is that desire to know 
that we are loved, that we are important, that each one of us matter. And I think that's the language of love because that's what we are all seeking after. And he did it so gracefully this morning. So Baxter, thank you. I figured with a name like Lockheed, I was the one to be intimidated. But, uh... <laughs> I tell you, um, after that, I was talking with Paul Young, uh, and because we hatched the plan, I think that weekend that I was there the first time, that to get Paul to come back with me. So I called Paul, and I said, I said, uh, we've been invited to come speak in, in Miami. And he says, so what's in Miami? I said, the hungriest people I've ever met in my life. He said, he said, I'm in. Yes. Because honestly, I mean, I know that, you know, Paul Young, I mean, he's, you know, international celebrity and all that stuff. He's just down to earth because he knows that Jesus has met him in his brokenness. And that's the game changer. The game changer is when you, when you see your own crap and you see Jesus holding you in your crap, then that levels the playing field. So there, there is no degrees. There, none of that matters. This is just us. We're brothers and sisters in Jesus, and we're walking together. And um, we love when Paul and I were there. I remember talking to him after we were leaving, just how amazed we were that you have a group of people that are that hungry, that open, and going forward. And we were both we both felt privileged and honored that we could actually be. Uh, a help in some way and a partner so i i just don't um that i was out in california one time i was holding forth on some conference and this this young guy who was um russian um he was there he's probably early 20s and he had lots of questions and we were talking about sunday finally sunday afternoon it was, it was time to go get something to eat. The conference was over. And so I was walking out in the parking lot and he comes up with his thick Russian accent. And he says, Dr. Kruger, Dr. Kruger. I said, he said, I have one more question. I said, okay, okay. He said, how can you carry such a amazing revelation and be so down to earth? And I, I said, well, that's easy. He said, what's that? And I said, I'm married. <laughs> I got three kids. I said, my kids are like, what? Somebody wants you to sign a book. What? Did you write a book, Dad? It's <laughs> like, no, it's, this, this is us. This is, this is, um, there's no room in the kingdom. You know, the apostle Paul says uh, that, that he recognized that one died for all, therefore all died. Therefore, I recognize no one according to the flesh. What what he means by flesh there is a, a fleshly, uh, non-Jesus vision. Uh, in other words, I, rich, poor doesn't matter. Black, white doesn't matter. Scythian, barbarian, Jew, Gentile, all these divisions are gone. There's just people. And all of us are family, and we're in this together, and we're all taking steps forward. And everybody has something to put on the table. That is valuable. There, there is no... Um, and, and that's just the way it really is. Everybody has something to put on the table for their brothers and sisters. And this is what I have to put on the table. And, but I don't ever go anywhere where I, I, I just, I would not go if I thought that this was about the Baxter show and I'm going to teach you. I'm sharing, I'm sharing with you from my own journey in life. Uh, and I know that it blesses people and, and that is a great honor, but not one single time in all 30 years that I've traveled the world have, has it ever been anything other than mutual? Mm, thank you. Always mutual. Thank you. And we do appreciate that. Thank you so much. And here's Ashley. So let's all say hello to Ashley. Hi, Ashley. Hi, everybody. And hi, Baxter. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I feel so um, blessed by this morning. And actually, at some point, I don't know if you guys would allow that, but 
I, I, do you remember I sent you a poem, like, maybe two months ago? I feel like so much of what he's saying is what I wrote about. And I wanted to share it with him um, at some point. Yeah. I don't know, now or later, whatever, whatever you want. But um, I just, oh, I'm so sorry. I wanted to share about Hope for Life and what it is and the mutuality, if you want to, <laughs> the mutuality that I experience here. Um, and I've been here for about a year, almost. It'll be a year in January, so in a month. And my life has radically changed ever since being here uh, from the inside out, like you were saying. Um, so much has transpired, but one of the things that came out of this year was me realizing that it was time for me to move forward and let go of these unhealthy attachments that I've had to my family. Um, and not in a dishonoring way, but so that I could be well. Because um, being with them was not making me well. <laughs> um, and it was hard to love them from that space. Um, so a lot has happened, but I somehow ended up uh, saying to people here, hey, I'm leaving, I'm looking for a place to go. And within like two weeks, Carmen over here, um, I would love it if you came up here, if you don't mind. Um, Carmen um, came up to me and she said, I heard that you're looking for a place to live. I'm like, yeah, I am. And it's not like moving out, like it wasn't simple. Like it's still not simple today. It's hard to make that decision. Um, but I've gotten to know Carmen and when I heard her tell me like, I have a space for you. It felt so holy, like that statement, like, like it was like a place was being prepared for me. And I knew it was with her when she asked. Um, Cause I've been craving like a mother and father, but specifically a mother for some reason. <laughs> um, and so whatever, we're months passed and this week I moved into her house mm -hmm. and it's been very challenging. The day I got there, I'm sure she can tell you my eyes were swollen. I had been crying in the car. I couldn't even go inside because it was so hard. Um, and one day, uh, Tuan had been helping me this week, but one day he couldn't help me, and I needed to build a bed frame. And he's like, oh, I you know, have to work, blah, blah. OK, awesome. And I'm like, let me ask Carmen. And I was like, do you want to build a, a bed frame together with me? <laughs> um, she's like, yeah, let's do it. Do you have tools? And so I'm like, let's go. But before that, we talked for like an hour and a half, right? right? So we started building the bed frame at like 10 o'clock at night. Maybe 10.30. Mm -hmm. But the most beautiful part that I think is like, wow, it's like, you know you're standing on holy ground, right? Like, she shared her story with me in detail about her family, her marriage, her kids, her life, her home, like this home that has so much history that I was being invited into. And like, I felt like it was so sacred that out of all people, I would be chosen and allowed to step into this story mm -hmm. that holds so much grief, mm -hmm. so much healing, so just so much, you know, I was like, why me, you know? And then we get to like the climax of the story where she goes, and then on December 5th, because she's telling me how it was time for her mm -hmm. to go. December 5th, 2017, I heard the Lord tell me, get up and go. Mm -hmm. I'm like, December 5th, that's Sunday. That's the day I left my apartment. Mm -hmm. That's the day my lease was up. That's the day I got up and left. And I had chills and we both had chills and it was like, this only happens here, like through doing this together and being open and inviting, not only inviting people in, but stepping into their story too. Um, so for me, Hope for Life is more than like a building. It's more than something that needs finances. It's like, it's, it's a place I think that the Lord has prepared for us. 
for everybody who comes here. Like he has prepared the hearts, the souls for us here, um, not only to heal, but to bring healing to those who come to. Um, so with that being said, I just want to invite you to be a part of that uh, financially by supporting this ministry. Um, but you support not just with your finances, but by being like Carmen, who sees me and invites me into her home and her heart. Um, and it's only been a week, and I already know that it's going to be probably one of the most life-changing times of my life as well, to be loved by her oh, God. and to love you and your family. Um, so be a part of it. <laughs> Ashley has blessed me in return. This is this is one of the Lord's gifts to me in my life right now. Thank you. She is a she is a gift. She's a treasure. Everything about this um, young lady is so beautiful, and um, and being here in in this place, this is our holiest ground, <coughs> and we really do need to take care of it. We need to take care of this place and make sure that this place continues to be here for all of us because we need it. We need one another. Um, we need this community of healing. We are the broken healers. We heal one another with just, you know, loving each other in, 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 the, in the brokenness um, that we each share, uh, not pretending that we're perfect or fixed, but just as we are. And I think, that um, our generosity goes a long way. Um, you know, what, what is generous for each one of you, you know, will, will depend on how you do your self inventory. But if you have it in your pocket and you want to put it in some place that's going to yield tremendous fruit, mm -hmm. this is the place. This is the place. Mm -hmm. All right. And <laughs> There are two different ways that you can. We invite you to support, um, participate. If you need an envelope, um, ask Gigi, please. Um, we do want to send a gift to Axter, and we do want to bless him um, for coming here. And um, if you need an envelope, ask Gigi. And if once you're done with the envelope, can you give it back to Gigi? Now, Guys, it's 11.22, and it has been a wonderful morning. We usually do have a break around 10.30, 10.45, 11-ish, um, and we end at 12. But do you think that we can push through it until 12? We don't pass Yeah, you all can go get your coffee and, and then and One second, wait, no. No, not oh, now. No, not now. now not one now. by one. No, no. <laughs> Let her talk. Huh? Let her talk for a second. Okay. That if we can, if we can just. If you're having talking problems, let's talk about it. <laughs> can we? Let's do it. One second, guys. Can we? Do you think we can push through it? Yes. Yeah. Can we push yeah. those in favor of that? Yeah. yeah. So let's just carry on, Baxter. We're just gonna push through it. If you need a little break to go pee or something, let us know. We'll give it to you. Two minutes. Uh, but let's start. Let's carry on. So let's carry on, guys. We're gonna carry on, and then we're gonna do all the announcements and everything at the very end. So it's back to you, Baxter. Thank you. Um, wow. Um, I want to I want to shift a little bit um, to talk about how Jesus uh, found his way into our darkness. Um, to do that, uh, let's go for just a brief time. I'm, I'm going to try to get through this so we can have some Q&A. But um, what happens um, inside of us also, the inner world, of the lethal root, I mean, the shame, um, the fear. Let's just take those two things. Shame and fear, we see this in Genesis 3 with Adam and Eve, and this is true for all of us, is that 
that shame and fear we then project upward and we create a god in the image of our own shame and fear and and sense of i'm not enough and then we go and we find bible verses particularly in the old testament that seem to support that view so that god then becomes distant um judgmental uh i like to think of it as as watching us like the like a hawk um from the infinite distance of a disapproving heart he he's already dismissed us he's just looking for more excuses to justify it um he's harsh he's not unlike our own earthly dads perhaps or mothers but we we're now projecting onto god um our own uh infidelity our own mistakes our own wounds our own hurts and we create a god in the image of that and we live in fear of that god so we're not going to look in the garbage can because that's going to give this god proof that he's right and so really it triangulates with our i am nots it goes round and round in a circle the whisper the wound the interpretation i am not fueling guilt shame fear anxiety which then goes up and creates a god in the image of that and then we have created an understanding of the cross in that triangulation. So we see, uh, or at least I was taught, I expect most of you were too, um, that Jesus goes to the cross in order to suffer uh, the wrath of God that was intended for you and for me and for the world. And that because Jesus was willing to endure the wrath of his own father, uh, then we get to go to heaven when we die. Um, I don't think that's anywhere near the truth. In fact, in fact, I would say that that's probably one of the greatest blasphemies in the, in in Western history. Um, the relationship of the Father, Son, and Spirit is so beautiful, and so right, and so deep, and so unclouded, um, and so other-centered, not self-centered. Uh, that the only way we can talk about that relationship is we, we have to begin to use words with Jesus and with John to say that the Father is in the Son and the Son is in the Father because their, their relationship is so good. There's no way that they don't pass into one another. They dwell in one another in that other-centered, self-giving, not, not a love. And it's, we're not talking about a hierarchy where God the Father is on the throne and the Son and the Holy Spirit are on the throne too, but it's smaller and lower. We're talking about a circle where each person uh, is uh, cherished uh, and loved. And that relationship is so beautiful and so good. Uh, we stretch language. The Father's in the Son. The Son's in the Father. They're in the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. In fact, he goes even further. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father because we're just alike. Um, and there is no difference between me and the Father. So these, these, these Trini that Trinitarian vision that comes from the early church is destroyed in our Western framework by this notion that God the Father is so disgusted and so angry at us that, that he has to be bribed, so to speak, to, to allow us to get in to heaven when what he'd rather do is banish us forever from his presence, but Jesus bribes him because Jesus goes and suffers the wrath of God on the cross. Uh, as long as we believe this, uh, all that we've talked about so far is not going to be nothing other than a theory because we're not going to open the garbage can when that God is what we believe. And, and that's the furthest thing from the biblical story. Uh, I know that that's scandalous to many people, and um, I'm at the age now where I don't care. You need to be scandalized on this because Jesus is going to teach you his, who his father is, and he's not like that at all. Um, so back to this, the Advent theme, the, the theme of uh, incarnation, the theme of the good shepherd. Um, we don't make Jesus the shepherd. We don't make him good. He is, this is the way he is because that's the way his father is. That's the way the Holy Spirit is. They are for us. And, and just like in your own family, and I, I begin to, to feel this in, in 
deeper ways when my grandchildren began to be born because I, I always love my own kids. I still do, but there's something different about being a grandfather. I think it's the fact that there's a whole lot of pressure that's, that's off um, and maybe, maybe a little bit of maturity along the way. But I remember when Caroline was born, and I have a t-shirt that says I am Caroline um, because what struck me was the minute we found out that Laura was pregnant, uh, Beth and I just fell in love with this child. Uh, we didn't know if it was a boy or girl, it didn't matter. Um, we just loved her. And when she was born, um, the day after she was born, we got to go and see her for the first time. Of course, we were all there at the hospital, both sides of the family. Um, but the, we went in the second day and Kyle, her, her dad was holding Caroline. And I just walked in, I'm like, you know, I'm a goner. Um, and I heard Rodney, who's Kyle's dad, walk over, he, he was right next to him and he leaned down and he whispered to Kyle, who was holding Caroline and Kyle was crying and Kyle's dad, Rodney said, Kyle, now, you know how we always felt about you. And it floored me when I heard that. I thought that's the message of Jesus right there. I'm going to bring you to know how your father in heaven has always felt about you. You don't control that. I mean, it's so written across my heart with Caroline and then Cooper and then Jeb and now Lucy. I'm sorry, but you can't change how I feel about you. You're not that powerful. I hope and pray for my grandchildren that they have a good life. I hope they make good decisions, you know, like all of us. But it doesn't matter. You don't change how I feel about you. I loved you before you were born. Now, when you take that picture, e either we're better parents and grandparents than the father is, or we're actually sharing in the way he feels about us in the way we feel about our kids and grandkids. And as we just saw there about our friends, but you back that up and you've got the creator. God is the father, son, and spirit, not alone, solitary God, but a God of relationship, a God who knows how to love from all eternity. They create us in this love. We can't change them. But our theology that we've inherited from the church tells us that we did. And now we got to change them back and we can't. So Jesus is going to come change the father back. No, Jesus doesn't come to change the father. He comes to reveal the father. He comes to show us what the father is like. He loves you. He is for you. You can't change that. He doesn't do abandonment. He created you with me and the, and the Holy Spirit out of our love for one another. And we don't do it. We don't abandon one another. We're not abandoning you. And we, we prepared a place for you. Just like Ashley was saying, we prepared a place for you. We've been thrilled. We've been waiting and you're here and we're lavishing love and care. And we know how you feel about us. We know how confused you are. You're not changing us. There is no sin. The worst sin in human history is dicedium. And that is the murder of God. And we committed it. As one human being joined together, we crucified the son of God. We cursed and damned the word of God. That's the worst thing that is possible within creation. And that has been redeemed. For our father took our rejection of his son, our damnation of his son, our cursing of his son, and he transfigured our rejection of his son into the new covenant, where he affirms that he is our father and he reaffirms his union and his purpose for us in his son. I want you to see this, and we don't have much time. Um, there, um, I, I, I do several online classes, I want, and this is the theme kind of all the time, coming back around to all this. But um, one of my classes is, is um, it's called Across All Worlds. It's a live interactive class. It's, it's the first Tuesday of the month. Um, 
you can go to our website and I'll let Lockie and Gigi put uh, make that available to you uh, if you want to be a part of it. But it's just once a month, first Tuesday. And uh, we've been talking about all these things. And it's just inevitably graduate gravitated toward uh, discussion of John's gospel. We're in chapter 10 right now. Um, that's the first Tuesday of the month. But then I also do another class called Introducing the Trinitarian Faith, which is an 11 week class. We're right in the middle of that now. We'll be offering that again uh, in the new year. Uh, quite amazing. We've got over 150 people from all over the world in that class. It just blows my mind. It's just thrilling. Um, we've done that class twice in Australia, once in India, twice in UK, Europe, now in, for the States. And uh, I'm going to be teaching a class in the new year, probably in March on Patmos. Um, and then there's another series that Paul Young and Bruce Walkup and I did called The Undiluted Gospel. Um, and that'll be available sometime in the next year. But so I'm doing a lot of the Zoom stuff and I, I like it. I love face to face, but this is this allows me to be a lot more places than just one. Anyway, one of the things that has emerged um, for me, uh, it's been present all along, like this diagram that I've been talking about today. I first came up with that diagram nearly 30 years ago, but it's like, I'm finally understanding some of what I was talking about. Um, the Holy Spirit just was way ahead of me, but, um, I've been talking about this. Uh, uh, sir, sorry, some people want to see the diagram. So can we put it up? Yeah. yeah. Hey, Emmanuel, can you put it? Thank you. Yeah, and make them available for downloads or whatever. Um, is, it, <laughs> is it that one? Uh, or which of the ones do you want us to put up, Baxter? Well, I tell you what, do just scroll through one, two, and three and go to the fourth one because that's what we're going to be talking about right now. <laughs> I think it's number four. It's the last one. Is it that one? Uh, There's one more. There's number five. One more. It's the one that says number five. Probably does. I don't, I don't, I, I know. That, that's it. That's it. Um, so what, what we have in Jesus becoming a human being, and John says that the word became flesh, and dwelt uh, among us, or you could translate that in us, which I think is the better translation. Um, but he doesn't just say that the word became human. That would be that would be anthropos in 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 the New Testament in Greek language. Uh, John says sarx, which is different than just human. It means human, but it also means that he became. Um, we're going to focus on the right side of the diagram. So if you want to blow that up so that that's what we see, it may, may be a little bit easier for people to see. Um, so when John says that the word became flesh, he's talking about the word, the son, who's face to face with his father, uh, not only becoming a human being, but entering into our flesh, which is our humanity twisted by the delusion. Uh, it's the human uh, existence, the form of our human existence that has emerged inside our delusion of separation and being not worthy and I am not and all of that. So what Jesus is going to do is not become a human being and give us new instruction, better insight than the prophets. Uh, an inerrant transcript called the New Testament. Uh, he's not going to leave it external because that that would be like me talking to the to the lady that was in the psych unit. Everything I said to her, she was filtering through her delusion. So it doesn't matter how good my information, how accurate, how liberating it may have been. It was all being filtered through her perception, which was her I am not. They had been written really large in, at this moment uh, in her life. Um, that that perception was was the grid. So Jesus, it's like, okay, is he going to be just the latest and greatest prophet and become a human being and preach to us and, and tell us about his father um, and try to get through the delusion from the outside and hope maybe some of us will listen, or is he going to do something much more radical than that? Um, Athanasius, one of the early church leaders, he said, the God of all is good. 
That's one of my favorite quotes in history. The God of all is good and supremely noble by nature. Therefore, he is the lover of the human race. And he says in another place, what then was God being good to do when his creation was on the road to ruin? What is God to do when we have so we have been so deluded that we think that God is the enemy to be avoided, that the light is the enemy that we don't want? Uh, is he going to come and become a human being and give us a better sermon, uh, more accurate information, better ideas about God? Or is the Father, Son, and Spirit going to do something far more radical? Because what then is Jesus the groom to do when his bride has been so deluded that she runs from him and avoids him at all costs? What do you do when you love someone who hates you? And that's the language that Jesus is you, that men love darkness and hate the light. How do you deal with that problem? You're not only deluded, but you're so deluded that you actually hate the solution and won't come near it. That's John 3, right after the Nicodemus story. So I want to go back to the John 17. If you got a scripture, it'd be good to, to read along. I want, uh, and I want to make the, the main point, and then, then we'll take some time and, and do some Q&A and um, and probably really good for uh, uh, Lockie and Gigi and others there that have some time after the meeting just to debrief and to pray. But I want you to see this. This is John's interpretation of the cross. And we'll start with verse 26 of, seven, of chapter 17 and move on into 18. Father, I have made you known to them. I, I've gotten inside the delusion. And I'm sharing my eyes and they're seeing with my eyes. I have made you known to them and I will make it. I'm going to finish this course. I'm not leaving any fragment of Baxter or anybody else behind that, that's lost in darks. So I'm going, um, uh, and I will make them known that the love with which you love me. I mean, this is the heart of the father. I, I don't want you to be in heaven when you die. I want the love with which I love my son to be in you and overflowing into all creation. And I'm not satisfied with anything less than that. No church pose, no humanist uh, hologram. No, the love with which I love my son from all eternity in you. Our love in you. Nothing less than our love, not an imitation of it. Our love in you and Jesus in you. And I in them, Father. I as your eternal son and the one anointed in the Holy Spirit in you. Now, that's what Jesus has come to do right there. He hadn't come to die to take away the wrath of God so you can go to heaven when you die. He's come to enter your delusion so that you can know the love of the Father with him, not a love like it, the love, the only love, the eternal love, the everlasting love, the love that does not do abandonment, the love that you can't change, no matter how bad you are or how bad you think you are or what's been done to you or what you've done to others, you cannot change the Father's love. And Jesus said, I'm going in and I'm going to, I'm going to bring them until they know and experience your love and they are not ashamed of themselves and I will lift their face so that them broken, sad, beleaguered, all their I am nots gets shattered by what they see in your eyes when I share my eyes with them. And then notice that the next verse, and there were no, there were no chapters or verses in when John wrote this. So the next thing he says, the, he says, Father, um, I will make you known to them that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. When he had spoken these words, he went forth and his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron, which is a valley um, where there was a garden. Now, I think this is deliberate on John's part. He's, got, he's going right back to the Garden of Eden. And this time he's not going to speak. He's not going to clothe Adam and Eve. He's not going to speak from a distance. He's going to find his way inside the bushes. And not only inside the bushes, but inside of Adam and Eve's mind, the delusion. That's what he's doing. I'm going to go inside the delusion. 
Now, Judas, who was also betraying him, knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Judas, then having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priest and the Pharisees, came with lanterns and torches and weapons. Now, this is just striking. Father, I have made you known. I will make you known. He looks up, and coming down the valley of the Kidron is the Roman cohort of being led by Judas, flanked by the temple police that were sent. The temple police were the Levites. That's the priestly tribe. So you got temple, you got religion on one side, empire on the other being led by Judas. And a cohort, um, a Roman cohort is uh, 1,000 soldiers. Nobody knows what to make of this. Could this, John's picture, Father, I have made you known and I will make you known. Jesus looks up and sees a 1,000 armed Roman soldiers marching in formation down this valley. And on the other side is the temple police. Mark tells us that there was multitude of them. Father, I have made you known, and I will make you known to them. He looks up, and that's coming at him. And John paints this beautiful picture, just this quick, lanterns and torches and weapons. You can see the swords. You can see the spears. You can see the smoke coming from the lanterns and flashing of light. And you can hear the marching coming down. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, coming down that valley. Father, I have made you known, and I will. So then it says, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that were coming upon him, proceeded forth. Father, I have made you known, and I will. I'm proceeding forth. He's walking right direct, standing right directly in the path of this beast. And they answered, and, uh, and Jesus says, whom do you seek? And they said, they answered, Jesus, the Nazarene which is like saying Jesus, the Mississippian, or, you know, it's not a noble thing in that culture to be from Nazareth, but it's just like the Lord to, you, to choose the things that are not. He said to them, I am Judas, who was there betraying him was standing there. When therefore he said to them, I am, he drew back and fell to the ground. They drew back again. Therefore, Jesus asked him, do you seek? And they said, Jesus, the Nazarene. And he said, I told you I am that therefore you seek me, let these go their way. All right. Just in the space of a little bitty paragraph, John has set this massive scene. Father, I have made you know, I'm in, I'm inside the delusion. It's working and I will, I'm going to finish this. I'm going to get down to the bottom in order that the love with which you love me may be known and experienced and felt and freed, freeing up people that don't know you. And, and I'm going to be in them with my anointing in the Holy Spirit. When he had spoken these words, he looked up and he proceeded forth. And down this valley comes a thousand armed Roman soldiers flanked on the other side by the temple police, the Levites. And, and they walk up to him and he's standing there. And he says, what do you want? Jesus and that's right. He says, Ego, I me. I am. That's the name of God in Isaiah. It's Ani who in Hebrew, Ego, I me in Greek. It goes all the way back to Exodus 3 in the Deuteronomy. Jesus speaks the name of God, I am. And they all fall out on the ground. Now, if I would have been Peter standing there, I'd have pulled him. Yeah, I'm with him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you could just feel the this moment. And and they fall out a thousand Roman soldiers armed. The temple police, Judas out on the ground. And then just a few verses later, Verse 12, so the Roman cohort and the commander, which is Keliarch, which is a commander of 1,000, and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. Now, how do, you, how do you go from, Father, I have made you known, to this moment where all these, the whole world is banded together behind Judas, empire, religion, and they come to him and he says, I am, and they fall out. How do you go from there to they bind him and take him to the high priest? What's, what's John doing? Why is he narrating the story this way? Jesus has won the victory. What? He said, oh, wait a minute. 
John wants you to ask that question. How, do, how does he get bound? No one takes my life from me. Your murderous mission, your plot to kill me will only be fulfilled by my submission to you. Whoever thought about God being one who submits to darkness? I'm going into the illusion, Father. It's not enough for me to wave power. I have to be on the inside of the delusion. Otherwise, they will never see you as I see you. How is Jesus going to get inside our delusion? By submitting himself to it. Here he is. He speaks, they fall out, they eventually somehow get up and they bind him and he submits to be to them. And he is going to be beaten, flogged, scourged, as it's called. Uh, the Jews considered uh, 39 lashes with that cord that had three splits on it with bits of glass and metal. And they string Jesus up like this with his back to the hip. And every time they whip him, those cords come all the way around his entire body. And then when they go back, they're taking flesh with him. The Jews considered 39 to be near lethal. 40 was lethal. So 39 uh, lashes. But the Romans didn't count. We don't know how many lashes. He scourged. Means that you probably can see his rib cage, maybe even see his kidneys. He's bleeding now. They mock him. They put a crown of thorns on his head and squish it. Now, if you've ever been cut anywhere on your face or your, you know how much blood that he's just completely drenched in blood. And you see him submitting himself to, to humanity at its most violent, wicked, depraved, insane, delusional self. Here's the moment you have the, the father, son himself, the word that uh, in whom they live and breathe and have their move, they're breathing Christological air, even while they are damning him and cursing him and beating him and spitting on him. At any second, Jesus doesn't even have to call him the father. He can just think it and all that disappears. It's all gone. Let's just reboot. This is too much, but he loves us. What then is God being good to do when his creation is in, trapped in delusion? He's going to go inside. But how do you get inside of delusion? How does the word of God become flesh? By submission to us in our flesh, in our delusion. At this moment, here it is, right here, John. He said, do you see this? The eternal son who is face to face with his father in the bosom of the father who is one with his father and anointed in the Holy Spirit is submitting to Rome and to Jewish religious delusion. And they are beating him to death. And they hoist him on the cross. They lift him between heaven and earth and they send him back. Beaten rejected, cursed, we damned and cursed the eternal word and son of the father. And the father in Christ, in Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, is embracing us, Romans, temple beliefs, Judas, me, you, at our worst right there, transfiguring our damning of the word of God, transfiguring that into the mercy seat where the Father, Son, and Spirit embrace the human race at their very worst in everlasting mercy, affirming, the Father affirming, this is my son. I don't do abandonment. I'm doing what I do, and I'm being the Father of my son. I am there when he needs me most, and not only am I, am I his his father, I'm your father, and I'm affirming that you are my children right here because I'm accepting you at your worst. And I'm affirming that I'm your father, and I, therefore I am taking your betrayal, your covenant breaking, your faithlessness, your treachery, and I'm transforming that into the new covenant with me. 
So that Baxter, your inclusion in my life and my son and, and the father is not based on your faithfulness. It's not based on your righteousness. It's not even based on your faith. It's based on your betrayal because I transform your betrayal into union with me and my son forever. This is what John is saying to us. This is not a moment where sinners find themselves in the hands of an angry God. This is the moment of all moments in cosmic history where God is in the hands of angry sinners and allows angry sinners to snuff him out. That's how he got to the bottom of the abyss. All the anger, all of the rage, all of the frustration, all of the hatred poured out on Jesus in this form of beating and mocking and cursing and lifting up. And he is taking, it's, it's like Caiaphas, the high priest, was the only high priest in all of Israel's history that really did his job. He offered up the one true sacrifice but he didn't know it and he did it for the wrong reason. That's the redeeming Jesus taking our stitch and turning it into something glorious, transfiguring our murder of the son into a new union, affirming that we belong to him forever, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's why John is saying, this is not about religion. This is not about externals where, okay, Jesus took the wrath of God, so that's been removed, so here's the book. You follow the principles, learn how to apply them to your life, and you get to go to heaven when you die rather than be. Now, Jesus is saying in John's gospel again and again, I have come as light that you may not remain in your dark. What we're in right now is darkness. Or if you want to use the different word, we're in hell right now. That's what this is, and Jesus has found his way inside. And he's turning on the lights from the inside out. Our contribution was to damn him. Our contribution was to crucify him and to send him back to the Father. As our offering unwittingly, which the Father meets us in and transform into the mercy seat. Now, we were, uh, I was at a conference out, out west a couple of years ago, and we were having communion at the end. And they had a chalice and they had a loaf of bread and, and we lined up and we would come and take a piece of bread and break it and dip it in the chalice and, and take it. And then we'd move over to the side and the next person will come. And, and I was standing there, you know, and I was trying you know, to think about things a little bit. I broke the piece of bread and right when I was dipping it into the cup, I heard the one who dips with me is the one who betrays me. I just stopped. And then I heard, and Baxter, I take your betrayal and turn it into your adoption. You are not included in my relationship with my father and my anointing in the Holy Spirit by your faith, you're included by me, by my submission to you. Now I'm asking you to start believing that. And I'm not asking you as a matter of doctrine or even Bible verse, I'm asking you on the inside. Are you gonna believe that I accept your betrayal of me? That my father accepts your betrayal of me? And this is the affirmation of how we feel about you? You cannot change how we feel. And so determined are we that you know that I that you know what I know when I look my father in the face and here you are my beloved son and whom my soul delights. So determined is I submitted to you. And I'm at the bottom. And right now, me and my father and the Holy Spirit are knocking at the floor of your brain and your theology and your mythology and your fear and all the stuff. We're knocking saying, hey, let it go. So what happens in us, as we do this, as we begin to take sides with Jesus, John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. 
the one who follows me shall never ever walk in the darkness it's, it's definitive it's a definite article the darkness shall uh, never walk in the darkness but shall have the light of life baxter i am making my father known to you that takes sides with me listen to me i want you to change how you think about my father based on me based on what i'm saying to you and i'm showing you and i want you to change how you feel about the holy spirit because i know you've actually you've been scared of the holy spirit your whole life you don't need to be scared of the holy spirit Baxter, while we're changing here, I want you to change, take sides with me uh, against the way you feel about yourself. I don't see you. My father doesn't see you. The Holy Spirit doesn't see you as you see you and you've concluded about you. You've got all these I am nots, and I'm here now. I am speaking. And you are free to continue to live in your world of I am nots. You are not free to get rid of the I am. I am here. And I'm talking to you, listen. So 25 times in John's gospel, he uses this phrase, truly, truly, I say unto you. I think a, a modern way of translation for that, I tell you the absolute truth, listen. Listen. The way you think about yourself is killing you. You can continue in it and it will destroy you and your family and your nation and maybe the earth. But that's not the final word. The final word is the beginning word, which is I am. And I'm speaking to you and I'm asking you to take sides with me. Take sides with me. Learn from me. Let my father love you. Let go of self-judgment. Let go of the I am nots. Let I am overcome the I am not whispered to you by the evil one. And I promise you that as you walk with me and learn from me, I will lead you into an experience of healing and wholeness and relationship with my father that is inconceivable to you right now because of how deluded you are. But I'm in the delusion and I'm not going away. And I got here because you rejected me. Now that is what you call a breakthrough. That is what you call a breakthrough because Every time I have ever heard the gospel, um, like on TV or radio or whatever, it's always about my faith. Somehow as if my faith changes God. Faith is not something we do that gets us into the love of God. Faith is our response to Jesus showing us who his father is and we say amen. It's a little amen because it doesn't square with my whole little amen. So faith is not something that moves you from outside to inside, from not saved to saved, from not justified to justified, from not adopted to adopted, from not reconciled to reconciled, from not loved to love, from not good enough to good enough. No. We have been embraced by the Father, Son, and Spirit at our very worst. Faith says, amen, I see this. And in seeing it, Jesus says, now take a step. Baby step. We don't have to get there today. Take a step. You willing to take a step, Baxter? Take a step. And you give me a step, and I'm going to give you a revelation. And then you take a step. How can I possibly believe that God's not disappointed in me? You got to be kidding me, Jesus. You know, you know what sin is? Sin is saying to Jesus, you're wrong about your father. You're wrong about me. You're wrong about yourself. You're wrong about the Holy Spirit and you're wrong about other people. And you're really wrong about my enemies. And I want you, Jesus, to change what you believe and repent and believe what I believe and sign up with me and believe in me. That's what sin is. And Jesus saying, yeah, I know what it is. And I'm in the middle of it and, and, and I'm not going away. And I'm the one that loves you with my father and the Holy spirit. And we're here. Take sides with me. Baby step today. Baxter. I want to show you what happens to you. I want to show you how all of a sudden 
the evil one whispers and your inner world shakes and you believe and I am not. And off you go trying to save yourself, trying to me. No, all that's going to stop. Not overnight, but it's going to stop because you're going to see how my father feels about you. And when you experience my father's affection and delight and everlasting love, Ophis, Satan, darkness, mom, dad, husband, wife, bank account, none of that stuff carries the weight that this does. This, I'm not asking you to look inside and pump up something, feel good about yourself. I'm saying you bring how you feel to me and my father. That's, that's the difference between religion and the gospel. Baxter, talk to me about what's going on inside of you. Bring it to me. Tell me about it. Because that's where I want you to see my father. That's where I want you to know the Holy Spirit, the redeeming genius. Because that, that's not real. That's what you feel. And it's almost destroyed you. And it hasn't destroyed you because I've got you. But that's what you feel. And you're not wrong to feel it. But let's talk about how my father feels about you. Let's talk about how I feel about you. So the whole movement of the biblical story is that Adam and Eve bought the lie of I am not. They created the delusion. And it's destroyed the earth. It's destroying us. And Jesus has entered the delusion by submission to us. He brought his father and the Holy Spirit with him. He's inside and the Holy Spirit's turning the lights on and saying, take some steps. Come on, take some steps. So practically, that's the questions that I gave you earlier. Uh, would you show me, Jesus, how I'm already sharing in your life? Because I, I still think that being religious or spiritual or doing the Jesus thing is a Sunday thing or has to do with prayer uh, it doesn't have anything to do with making fishing lures or being a dad or granddad or friend jesus I, I need to see this in my life and i need to see you in my pain because i i've got to lid open jesus because i i know now that you're at the bottom of it so that means whatever is between you at the bottom of my issues and all my issues that they're the enemy that's keeping me from living from that garbage can becoming a, a, a river of not toxic waste, but a river of living water flowing out. So now I've got some courage and I want to look at some of this and you're going to hold my hand and walk me through this. And Jesus says, yep, I'm never going to forsake you. We don't do abandonment in our family. That's your issue. You bring that to tar my father's faith with this eager judge. Who's just hanging judge. who just wants to do you wrong and just give him an excuse. And that's not, that's not my father. You can't change how he feels about you. Take sides with me. So how are you in my pain, Jesus? And another question to ask. This, ask Jesus, what are my I am nots? Would you show to me my I am nots? Would you show to me how I have agreed to this because this is hindering me from believing what I'm hearing you saying? So I don't want that. I got to see that the fascinating thing about my grandmother speaking to me that day and saying to me, you know, bless his heart. He's just dumb. I have no recollection of that at all. That's the way evil works. Hurts. You get hurt. He whispers word, hides the memory. And all he got to do is punch it. And we start shaking on the inside. We trigger, we're afraid. We become self-centered. We become hiders. We become self self-saviors or in denial or manipulation or control or medication. And off we go. Jesus is saying, I'm inside. You can hear me and see with my eyes. That's what he's inviting us into. I'm inside of, of the greatest sin possible, which is rejection. And we have transformed human rejection of Jesus into the salvation of the human race. You imagine, I, I sometimes think, I'm not, I'm not arguing this point because it's unnecessary, but it's just a, a thought experiment. You imagine that when we die and we go stand before Peter, you know, the, the old stories always say that, that it's not Peter. It's Judas standing there. Just imagine. And we're like, well, I don't know. I'm not going in there. And Judas goes, I know, I know. 
he took what I meant for evil and he saved the whole cosmos with it. I just, I just, I, all I do is walk around amazed of how he met me in my darkness and transformed my betrayal into the salvation of the human race. I don't know who meets us there. I know that we meet Jesus, the real Jesus. And we're not going to be surprised because he's in every one of us. And he's asking us to believe. Believe. Walk with me. Take steps. Take baby steps. Ask me these questions. And as you ask the question, you know, what are my I am nots or my agreements that I've made with evil? You can always you can also ask him if you want to get bold. There's no reason not to be, because this is what keeping us back. You can ask him, say, Jesus, would you show me my pose? Would you show me my go-to pose? I don't want it. I don't want a pose. But it's so deep in us, we don't even know it is a pose. Jesus, would you show me my pose? Show me how I don the vestments. And what do I do? What's my go-to? How do I hide? How do I protect myself? How do I center every the world? How do I manipulate? How do I uh, control? Because those are enemies that are keeping us from sharing in his life. It always comes down. This is the question. I don't care if you agree with a single word that I said today. I don't care if you believe Baxter. I, I'm not looking for that. You ask Jesus, are you in me? Are you in my brokenness? Are you in my willful, stupid stuff? Did you bring your father there with you? And the Holy Spirit, Father, I have made you known to them, and I will make you known, in order that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. What's my pose? What are my I am nots? Show me how I'm already sharing in your life now. Show me how it gets twisted. I want to walk with you, Jesus. I want to hear your word and be set free by the truth, which you made true, not me. Amen. Let's uh, take a quick break. We're going to do some Q&A right now. Yeah. Um, and we're going to just do a few of them before we wrap um, this wonderful, amazing, beautiful morning up. Um, I feel like, you know, like when you go to a place where there's all this amazing food that it's just so good, and they tell you, you have three and a half hours to eat it. <laughs> and, and you want to eat it, and, and uh, you don't know if to steal and take some home in your handbag or in your pocket, and it's really going to last. Um, but that's how I feel. It's been amazing and wonderful. So um, does anyone have any questions? I have, I have two people on Zoom. Yeah. Okay, so there's two questions in Zoom. So, um, do you want to? Okay, Susie, and can you read it aloud? Well, I can unmute them. So oh, okay, okay, Susie, um, you're going to be unmuted and you can ask your question. <clears throat> and remember, ask one question, don't extend too much. Let's go, you know, like just to the question, don't make it like. A story and then the question. So, I mean, just to make it um, efficient. Susie. Sorry. I don't know that I have like a question, but I just wanted to say to Baxter, thank you so much for helping me to see that God and I are on the same team. Um, I feel like I have this reoccurring sin um, and it, and it's something that I almost started to see, like, maybe I do this to numb, like the things that you were saying. And th that was so helpful to me. So thank you so much. But what I realized is that it's not necessarily my way for some people, it may be, but for me, it's not necessarily my way of um, numbing, but it's my way of it's like cutting for some people. It's my way of seeing like that I'm alive, that I'm real because my defense mechanism is numbing. 
period. Like throughout the day, I'll just shut down. I'll just distance myself. I'll just isolate myself because of the disappointment of not being able to connect, um, of feeling rejection, of feeling like I'm trying and this hurts too much to try to um, connect with people and just not having that. Um, and so it, it just was a big revelation. And I just want to thank you so much for the things that you shared and for the way that you just made me feel like it's not me against God. I mean, I just totally saw how Jesus, when he was praying to the father was saying, take this cup from me. And that's not him against God. It was just him feeling the fullness of humanity saying like, I feel this and it's intense. And if there's any other way, and yet when he said, not my will, but yours, he's like, I know what the original plan was. I know what it's going to take, but man, I feel the blunt of this. I feel how intense this is. And knowing that God feels what we feel and is not against us. And like, why are you doing that? But just so compassionate about the fact that we feel that same intensity, whether it be like you said, something big or something small, and he's on our team and he's with us. And he's saying like, I'm not going to leave. And no matter what, you know, I'm with you and I'm going to be there with you every step of the way. I just appreciate you so much. And this morning has been so amazing. And I just want to say thank you. Amen to that. Thank you. Wow. Hmm. That's amazing. Thank you, Susie. Thank you. Next question in Zoom. Ileana? Yes, hi. Okay. Thank you, so, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Um, the delusion is so real to me. It's in a, in a two part, I'm gonna tell you real quick. I relate to being unwanted from my mother's wound because of her delusion, because she was that lady that you talked about. So that made it so real for me with, you know, with my father, but with my father, I don't want to have any delusions, but more relationship in his, you know, I wanna be in his light and therefore this was all like in steroids, so I need to hear more. I want more and more and more. So if you can tell me and suggest to me another class, another book, etc., I'm, I'm like I'm trembling as as I hear my sound of my words because it's very deep and very profound. So I, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart what this class has meant to. To me, thank you so much. Fantastic, thank you both, Susie and Alina. Uh, yeah, this this is um, we're in this together, and it's real, and it's beautiful, and uh, we're we're you know when you get in a room with people, um, and, and I told Lockie and, and Gigi and and several of them this the last time I was down there is that. I, I'm not coming to teach you anything. Uh, you, you're doing it. I'm just giving some clarification. And, I, and I, I'm a strong voice against uh, some of the systems that are keeping you, keeping you down, not least religion and humanism. So um, in, in fact, Paul and I talked about that, you know, that, that you guys are doing what we're trying to get everybody else to come join. Um, <laughs> So quite beautiful. There are lots of resources, um, and I, I don't want to overwhelm you on it. The main thing uh, right now is the questions, and I'll go over them again. And uh, you can, Alaki, you, somebody write these down and, and share them. But the first question is, Jesus, what are my I am nots? What are, what are my I am nots? Uh, slash agreements that I've made with darkness that I didn't even know about. Um, uh, number two, a, a good question is, Jesus, what have I misinterpreted in my life? Um, 
and get a, get a notebook for this because the first time I asked the question about the I am I am nots and uh, agreements, I filled up three pages. And interestingly enough, one of the first things that came may have been the first things, uh, but I remember two very early on. Um, one was I had agreed as a young boy because of the teaching of the church that I could not hear God speak. That God no longer speaks to us directly. He's given us a book. Now you're dealing with the eternal word of God who is not never silent, mind you. Uh, I didn't know that uh, I'd done that. And I'm like, Jesus, I, I, I don't. So you break an agreement. You just say, Jesus, I break that agreement in your name and give me an agreement to go in my place. Well, how about this one, Baxter? You can hear me. <laughs> um, that was just like, wow. Um, second uh, thing that I saw quickly was I saw myself standing in the kitchen. Beth and I uh, were having some kind of spat about something that's inconsequential now. But it was real at the time. And I remember I saw myself open the door from the kitchen into the garage, which goes out to where my shop was. Um, and I opened the door and I, and I muttered to myself, this shit ain't never going to change. So what an agreement. You know, what, what an agreement with darkness. And I said, Jesus, that's, that's just Google. I mean, you're in me, you're in Beth. <laughs> you're the one that's going to change it. Um, I'm, so you, you get the, you, you begin to make that list, um, and, and you may want to do this with other people, share it with them and talk about it. But, um, and what, what have I misinterpreted in my life, which is a big, huge question. Um, then another question is how do I pose and, and don't. Don't be afraid of any of these questions, especially that one about the post. It'll be funny because your children already know. I mean, they, they, they've seen through it forever. And it's just stuff that we can't say. I remember uh, talking with my mother when, before she died, they were living in a place, an assisted living place. And I went and took her to lunch one day and her and dad. And, and um, I said, where do y'all want to go? And my mother's like, well, it doesn't matter. You know, and I know good and well, it does matter. She's already picked the place out. And, you know, and I said something, I said, mom, you don't have to manipulate the situation. We'll go where you want to go. Well, I don't manipulate. And my brother was with me. He said, oh yeah. Oh no. Mom doesn't manipulate. You can just stop a Super Bowl with a sigh. It was really funny because she honestly had no idea what she does. She didn't see it. So blind spots, agreements, what have I misinterpreted? How do I pose? Um, and another question is Jesus, how do you see me? And one that goes along with that is, um, Jesus, what, what is my name? I'll tell you two quick stories about those two. Um, those two questions in particular come from um, a program called Operation Restored Warrior. That's not the Wounded Warrior Project. This is another one that started by Paul Lavelle, who's a friend of mine, and Paul Young's. Um, and it started for principally for special ops people coming back with PTSD and combat stress disorder and suicidal ideation, and all the bad stuff. Um, and they've had probably 2000 soldiers go through their program and every one of them have been healed. Uh, and, but those questions come in that program. And I, he asked me, would I help be a part of the program? And I said, well, I want to go through the program first, not knowing what I was asking. Um, but I knew that I could trust Paul Avail, the Lord, and that very clear. So anyway, I go out there and of course I'm surrounded by not just military people, but special ops people. I mean, they could, they could kill me and I wouldn't even know they moved. You know, it was like, what have you done? And one of the most liberating weeks of my life, but, um, 
after different parts of it, they send you out with questions and those were two questions uh lord what is my name and and uh, how do you see me so i'm out there and i said i'm out in, in the wilderness in colorado um looking at the mountains of vale way down you know 50 miles away and i said lord how do you see me and there were three chairs or five chairs sitting around uh under a pavilion that obviously some people have been sitting around talking and they pushed them back and i'm just standing there underneath this pavilion looking down and and i asked you i said how do you see me and i started crying and i i couldn't like okay i'm you know how dumb i am you know <laughs> i'm just laughing and i said you got to make this clear and, and i fell down on my knees crying and i just started thanking the lord i said thank you for john and paul and peter and Irenaeus and Athanasius and Hillary and Gregory Nazianzus. And I just came on through history, people that I have great respect for that I've learned from. And um, um, I got to J.B. Torrance and by this time I was just a mess. And I just said, Jesus, I don't get it. I do not get it. Uh, what are you trying to tell me? He said, Baxter. He said, the reason you love these men is because you're one of them. And that's the way I see you. <laughs> like, whoa. I mean, I just, I'm like, I, I can't argue with Jesus. Now, I know better than this, but this doesn't fit my self narrative. Bless his heart. He's just dumb. This is the way I see you. You love these men that are called church fathers because that's what you are. That's why I see you, you know, and it's just matter of fact, plain lump lump. Okay. All right. Um, Okay. Uh, it's like, it's just like when he hits you with his interpretation, it just doesn't even have a place inside of you for a, a toehold, you know, but I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm not arguing with, it. I know it's you. And I know you're going to ask me about this one day. And, you know, and so then I asked him, I said, so uh, what's my name? And he said, he said, I've told you your name before, but it was too grandiose for you and you didn't believe me. I said, okay, I'm listening. I'm listening. He said, your name is Liberator. I'm like, okay. They gave me it, Operation Restored Warrior. We cannot hear you. I said, I said, okay, okay I'm, I'm listening. Uh, I, it doesn't have a place to, you know, to, to, to sit in me because I don't see myself that way. And Jesus is like, well, yeah, it does have a place to sit. And that would be me because I'm in you. And this is where I see you. And this is your name. So fast forward six months. I'm sitting right here in my office one day and out of the blue for no reason. It just, I, my first name is Charles. Charles Baxter and uh, both Charles is my dad's dad. Baxter comes from my mother's family and my parents always call me Baxter. And for whatever reason, I never liked the name Charles. I don't even know why I just never did, but I've always gone by Baxter. So it doesn't matter. So anyway, I'm just sitting here and I thought, I wonder what Charles means. I Google it meaning of Charles it, you know, search pops up Charles. The great liberator, a free man who frees men. I'm like, oh my gosh. And I was named this from my mother's womb and still didn't. So this is where, you know, you can see posing. You can see how he sees you, how he thinks of you, and you can grow into that. Uh, you have to own it. You do. It is, as alien as it may be, I have to own I am a liberator. And that's as plain as anything when I look back. My whole life has been a fight for that, to get out of the emptiness of religion. I never did buy into humanism, but but just to, you know, extricate from that, because I know that's not the answer. I know Jesus is, but I don't know how he's the answer. And I look, I look back at my life and think, man, he's been teaching me the whole time. So I, 
that's what I do is I share what he's given me to see and people get free, <laughs> they get liberated. Like, oh, okay. Um, so th those are the types of questions that you process with. You just write them in a notebook and you start asking and it's a conversation with Jesus. It's not a, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read the Bible and find out where, he may send you to a verse. Uh, he's limitless in his creativity and he knows what you need. Um, but you have to own it. Um, that's that's um, in John's gospel, you know, when he refers to himself as the beloved disciple, he used to just gall me. I mean, who in the earth would refer to himself as the beloved disciple? I mean, not a beloved, the beloved. And I'm like, man, that's just, I don't get that. And so I was doing research in the gospel because there's all these I am statements like Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. I'm the bread of life. I'm the door. The good shepherd. I'm the resurrection life. I'm the way, the truth, the life. I'm the true vine. Uh, and then there's a whole nother set of I am statements that don't have a predicate. So he doesn't say I am the light of the world. He just says I am like the passage that we read out of John 18. And there's seven of those. And the one that we just read the eight in chapter 18, it's repeated three times. Um, so there's seven I am statements, the name of God. And I was reading one day and I, I discovered in John's gospel that there's actually an eighth I am statement. It's the only one that is not spoken by Jesus. It's one of the characters in the story. And I just sat there thinking, my goodness, it's the man born blind. And Jesus healed him. And his friends and people around said, is it this the man that was born blind that used to sit and beg? And some of them were saying, no, 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 it's just somebody that looks like him. It can't be him. It's just somebody similar, whatever. And the text says, he kept saying, I am, hey, go I me. And I thought, oh, I get it. John is saying, yes, I am the beloved disciple of Jesus. And so are you, but you don't know it and you hadn't owned it. I have, and I've written the gospel so that you can too. So to be able, this is when your, your shame is being healed. It's when Jesus is lifting your faith. This is not about how you feel about yourself, Baxter. This is about the way we feel about you and you amen in that. I am that. Yes. Um, and that's, part of the way it heals if we don't own it we're still given the i am not the greater weight with our soul and believe me i don't know about you guys but man, that's some alien turf to go from the world of i am not that i've lived in you know to yes i am uh and it sounds like arrogance the evil won't hit you all kind of stuff if it's not arrogant if it's what god thinks we're agreeing to him not with evil so these are questions that you go to work on. This is the next step for, for us to work through those things. Um, and, and that's a process. And you share it with other people. Uh, you share it. And, and the thing that it amazes me about it is that there, there are no I am stories that are not universal. I, I am not stories that are not. I mean, it's, it's the same tempter, the same deceiver. He doesn't have too many tricks. He just he shadows in or he drafts in behind the hurt of a, of a wound and he interprets it. Um, and like I said, and, and I think um, Susie mentioned um, the, the particularities of that. I mean, some wounds are so profound that, you know, only uh, nail scars hands, nail scarred hands can touch. But other wounds were, you know, relatively speaking, not that big a deal, but man, they are, they're, they're a big deal to us. Um, so he, owning it just means you're staring it in the face. And so when Jesus said to me, I've given you my mind, use it. He says, ask me that. Well, you can keep on believing that you're not smart if you want to. I never made you to be smart. I made you to share in my smart mind. And Paul Young and I have an inside joke that we talk about all the time about, you know, people say different things about our books and all this and this, but we know that the Holy Spirit loves to make us look smarter than we are. Because this is about sharing in, in the mind of the Spirit, which is way bigger.
In fact, um, George McDonald has an essay called the, the Fantastic Imagination. Um, and I was reading the other day and he said, he said, uh, a man may well himself discover truth in what he himself wrote. For he was dealing all the time, he was dealing all the time with things that came from thoughts beyond his own. So that's a that's a question. How am I participating already that I'm not aware of it? Uh, then you'll really see your life differently. You'll be just that's where the that's to me where the the rubber hits the road. I start seeing ordinary human things is not having their origin in me at all, but in the Father, Son, and Spirit. Um, and let me give you an example. So there's a, there's a book on our website, a free download called The Secrets, about 20 pages long. It's a PDF. This uh, is, is the kind of stories that I'm talking about. So I was in, uh, I think, Australia. I've been down there a bunch of times through the years, but this was one of the early trips. And um, I finished speaking and we were having tea and just standing around talking. And this lady comes up to me. She's got a little baby in her arms and she's um, crying her eyes out. I mean, he even, like, can't even catch a breath kind of thing. And I just put my hand in and I said, well, just calm down. I said, I can't even, what's going on, you know? And, and she's finally calmed down and she said, Baxter, she said, there are two um, Pentecostal churches in our town or charismatic or something, I don't know, but spirit churches. And she said, both of us, both congregations have been praying for over a year for the Holy Ghost to fall on us. And the Holy Ghost fell on the other church and didn't fall on us. And we're devastated. And so the pastor said, if I was coming to please ask you that question to see what you think about it. And, you know, it's one of those moments where the Holy Spirit loves to make us look smarter than we are because I have no clue what to say to that. I'm just saying, Holy Spirit, you got something here. <laughs> and I, I said, is this your child? And she said, yeah. I and mean, she's looking like, what's that got to do with anything? I said, do you love this child? She said, well, of course I do. I said, you would, you would lay down your life for this child. Well, of course I would. I said, in fact, you do lay down your life. You give up most of the whole day that you're awake to tend to her. And she said, what, what, are, you, what are you talking about? I said, I said well, what I want you to understand is that in 10,000 years from this very moment, right now, 10,000 years, that church building, probably the whole town where the Holy Ghost fell on them and not you, it's not going to be here anymore. But this child in 10,000 years is still going to be calling your mother from your body, from your union with your husband, the Holy Spirit has created something that will last forever. And you're asking me why the Holy Spirit didn't fall on y'all? So you've identified with the Holy Spirit with a few things over here. That's the Holy Ghost. And you don't see the supernatural creation of the triune God in your body. I said, that's the Holy Spirit right there creating this. So that's, that's where our eyes begin to open and we say, oh my goodness, I thought that was just mother. There is no such thing as just motherhood. It's only motherhood in the Father, Son, and Spirit. There's only fatherhood in the Father, Son, and Spirit. It's only sonship and daughters. I mean, so you begin to see the presence of the Father, Son, and Spirit already at work in your life, but you're not able to give it credit for that because of the schisms in our mind. And then once you see that going on in your life, you're going to start seeing it everywhere at Walmart, at the grocery store. Um, people working three guys show up in my backyard just just beyond my property line because uh, we live on kind of a hill and the bottom the very bottom just beyond my property line is where i didn't know this before all all the sewage from the community meets in one place and uh apparently it gotten backed up and they they dug a hole 15 feet deep uh, and i watched the three guys and all three of them jumped down the bottom of that hole and they cut a piece of that eight inch sewer pipe out about that long and replaced it and fixed it 
and I'm watching them. I mean, I'm thinking, I think this has got to be the roughest job in the world is replacing sewer pipes. And I, I thought, hmm, three guys, three, three people, stooping down to deal with all of our crap. I think I've seen this before. I've seen this kind of sacrifice, this kind of love, this kind of determination before. I just thought, who in the world would ever think that was the Trinity? That's just three guys, and they're working a lower job because that's not doctor. And, you know, no, that's it. The kingdom right there in front of me. Um, now, uh, one other story. My son uh, and I play golf together. We were playing one day with some of my buddies uh, in, in uh, the course. I don't live on the course, but it's, it's in my neighborhood. And their houses all the way around the course. And so anyway, we're standing on the fourth tee, which is a par three, and there were people on the green. So we were just standing there jawing. And I looked up and I saw smoke coming. And I said, son, that's not from leaves. That's a house. So he and I and my friend David <coughs> jumped in the carts and went driving through the neighborhood. And sure enough, we came to this house. And the garage was fully engulfed in flames, billowing out. And there was a car in there. And a lady came running out the front door, screaming about her dogs in the backyard, or dog. So my son and David went running around the other side, jumped a six-foot fence, scaled it, got the dog, brought it to her. By the time they got it to her, the, you could hear the fireman coming. And I thought, well, that, you know, there's no point in trying to put this house out. It's gone. I need to water down the houses next to it to keep them from, you know, igniting. And the truck pulls up, and this one guy jumps out. He looked about five eight, um, young guy, probably in his twenties. Already had his outfit on, pulled his mask down, and turned his oxygen on, grabbed the hose, and starts walking across the yard. The other guys were doing something with the truck, and he squared off. It's flame, it's the two car garage billowing out. I could feel the heat from it across the street in somebody else's yard. And that guy squared off and there's a car inside and he, he hits the nozzle and he walks up in that flame, holding that nozzle and puts that fire out by himself. I'm praying that the car doesn't blow up. You know, I, 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 was, I was just like, oh my goodness. And then it was like, oh, I've seen this love before. Willingness to sacrifice possibly your own life for the benefit of others, risking it all to care, to love. And I thought, that's the love of the Father, Son, and Spirit, not on our watch. Didn't create you to perish. Billowing forth from that young man, giving his life, risking everything. And so he puts the fire out and the other guys are doing what they do. And he comes and sits down over in the yard where we are. He's spent. Somebody hands him a water. And I literally prayed. I, I did. I said, Lord Jesus, please don't let some well-meaning Christian person come up and ask this young man, have you got saved yet? Yeah, I would appreciate you putting the fire out. But have you got saved? Have you prayed a prayer and jumped into our delusion so you can go to heaven when you die? And cannot even begin to see that what we just saw embodied in a human being was the eternal passion and love of the father son and spirit for the sheep risking it all laying all down in order to protect and confirm and help so you start seeing people in all walks of life participating in a, in their unaware uh, i would hazard a guess that that guy doesn't ever miss church and i would hazard a guess that he never leaves church without feeling less than I, I got to do more for God. I got to, which means I got to get more involved in the life of the church. And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you, you just stay, say what you're doing in the life of the Trinity and keep putting these fires out. Cause this is helping a lot of people, you know, I mean, it, this is service. So that's where these perspective and processing these questions begins to change us. And we begin to see people very differently. We have, in, as you know, in our country, a, a tradition that when you see an officer, a military personnel in uniform, that you you just simply say to them, male, female, 
whatever rank, thank you for your service. I think it's beautiful, but I think it's what we ought to say to everybody. The garbage collector, the teacher, the dude that fixes cars, the guys that work on the whales in, in the Gulf to make us, you know, you start going to the, the, uh, the baker, the people that make that unbelievable coffee that we had that when I was down there, we went fishing, we stopped and we got, it was a little shot of something that was coffee and sugar. And <laughs> but you start seeing how people are participating in Jesus's world and they don't know it, but we do. And that's the job of the church is to bear witness to that, which is and that's true of everyone, whether they see it yet or not. And that tends to open a lot of doors for conversations. So I can go on and on and on about that, but read the secret. Um, we have in the room here one more question, and I think we'll wrap up with that. Um, I know there's a few more in Zoom, but um, we took two from Zoom and uh, Tuan. Do you want to stay here, Tuan? Thank yeah, you. This is Tuan. I just want Thank you, Baxter, for everything it's that you not, did today. It's not on. Your mic? It is on. Okay, I got to get it up here. Okay. Closer, yeah. And speak louder. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I'm sitting in the back here and I just continue to just feel like the strings of my heart being plucked. Everything about you're saying, just like you're playing all these things with my heart. And it's just like you're saying so many things that are clicking for me. And one of the things that really made like a huge impact, and I've been thinking about it the entire time, and it relates to the story you shared about your name, um, was you said that the biggest lie that we've believed for a long is separation. Right. And when I was putting the dots together, I think the biggest lies in my life was believing that I am separated, but also separated from my true self. A lot of the I'm nots that I believe about myself are separating me from who I am. That's right. And so when you shared your name, um, Charles and the name Liberator, I remember the day that I stood here up, up here as well. And there was a story that happened here that Anna was, was sitting right across she randomly called out a name towards me that was not my name. And I was confused and we all were confused of why she said that. I wasn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the name was Komoi. And from that day, I think I'm trying to receive that name and hear it more often and believe it and let it speak to me because we also did a identity course with Jamie and Donna Winston. Winship. Winship, sorry. And we walk through the same kind of exercise where we're asking Jesus, we're giving him all the things we believe about ourselves. And we're asking him to tell us what he sees and what he believes and what he, what he calls us. And I remember that day he called me trustworthy. And, I, and from that, I think, I don't know if it was the same time, but that name came up, Kamoy, and I looked it up and it was also the word, the meaning trustworthy. So for me, that has a backstory in itself. And I feel like, I can go on and on about it, but the whole thing about what you're saying today is, is hitting me because it's this, the, these lies that I believe about myself has disconnected me from myself and in return disconnected me from how God sees me. And then, of course, that's where all my striving performance and all the poses that you're talking about come from. So it's, it's rooted there, and I'm thankful that you shared your story because it connected to me and I felt connected to you. And I don't have a question. But my question that just came up was, how did you embrace your name? Like, where did you, when you just saw it, of course, it was amazing and it all linked together, but coming to this day where you are now, how are you connecting to that? I didn't understand. How did I embrace what? Your name, your name liberated. Well, I wouldn't have done it other than I, it was a, one of the most powerful encounters with Jesus I ever had. I knew he was talking to me and I knew that he knew that I knew that he knew. <laughs> it's called a crisis of judgment uh, uh which is not uh, intended to destroy except our darkness it's intended to liberate and so i'm just like okay and and once i began to look back i began to see and this is what this is the value of this about beginning to see how Jesus am I already present and participating in your life? And oh, I, I wouldn't have given that credit. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have done that. And so in the same way, your, your name is trustworthy. Well, how Jesus, have I been trustworthy now? You know, what, 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 
uh, that's the one side of it. The other side um, is, um, in, in terms of owning it, the other side is don't try to make it happen. Because yeah. I don't, I'm in the process of being liberated myself. So it's not like I've arrived and now I'm looking down on everybody else and, you know, reaching down. I mean, I'm in the active process of my own liberation. Uh, and what I've learned is I don't have, I don't even know how to spell it, you know? And if I thought there were five steps, I would never give them to anyone because all you're doing there is just being American. Jesus tells us what to do. We'll set up a committee. We'll come up with 18 things to go do. We'll raise the money. We'll make it happen. We'll call it the kingdom of God. But there's no liberation in it. Right. It's, like, it's just what we do. We'll franchise it. You know, we'll, we'll make it into McDonald's and, and, and duplicate it. Well, no, no. Jesus is the liberator liberating me, and he's given me a part to play in his liberation of others. He's, he's the trustworthy one. Yeah. And he's given you a part in his trustworthiness. Um, uh, so don't, try, don't try to make it. Don't, Somebody, come on. <laughs> all right, all right. I'm getting on. I'm getting on the plane right now. I'm coming to Miami. <laughs> well, it's truly rolling now. I gotta pick that up now. Quickly, I just want to, I threw this book at you because you are preachy, okay? Um, but I wanted to say really quickly, because you were saying, like, so I'm a runner. I run from the light. So how do you not run? Do you just pray, God help me not to run? Because I hate that, like, Christian answer. Oh, I'm just praying about it. You know, like, what do you do not to run? That's it. Ooh, you don't run. All right. All right. Uh, now, great question. I, I can make fishing lures in the kingdom of God, or I can make them as an act of running. Same exact thing, same place, same lures. Um, so what can I do that I'm not running? Um, nothing you can't make it not running jesus does and he's the good shepherd who knows when we're running and when we're participating so we're basically if you got if you want to ask one thing you can do i mean there's no formula it's just say jesus i don't want to run and i want to thank you jesus because now i see that i do run and i've never seen that before so you have you're the one that's interested in me not running. So you now brought me to the place where I know that there is such a thing as running. Well, I don't want to do it anymore. I don't know how not to do it, but that's the healing facing going, working through these questions in, in community. You begin to find yourself, you know, I, I didn't try to be a liberator. I just suddenly found myself and I look like, Oh, this is helping people, you know? So it's, it's, we want formulas. I do. I mean, I won't, you know, 10 steps. No, he's the one that's brought us to the place where we know we're posing and we're running. We didn't even know that before. Let's it's like 10 years ago, we didn't even know there was such a thing. Now we do, and we don't want it. And we don't know how to get there. Well, at, just keep asking him. Um, and, and, and ask him also, this is, this is another one. That's, um, Cause I used to feel really guilty about coaching baseball and making fishing lures and you know, because what's that got to do with the kingdom of God? You know, <laughs> and, and and my daughter Laura, uh, this she was ten years old at the time. She's thirty now. Um, she comes out to my shop one day and she said, "Dad, how, how did you know how to make all these lures? How did you know how to carve these? How did you know how to paint them? How, how did you get these eyes to look so real and the and the tail and how did?" You know, and I thought like, oh, and I, I said, this is another illustration of how the Holy Spirit loves to make you look smarter than you are. I said, well, Laura, I've got a friend that loves to fish. And whenever I hang out with him, I get ideas about fishing. And he's pretty excited when he sees his ideas come and kind of get carved into being. And she's looking at me. She's like, I know your friend. And I said, 
I said, yeah, you know. And she named off two or three names of guys, you know, close friends of mine that would come around the house all the time. I said, no, no. She said, well, and I'll never forget the way she looked at me because she knew this was the right answer, but she couldn't conceive of how it could be. She said, you, you're talking about Jesus, aren't you? I said, yeah. I said, you know, when you're playing the piano? He said, he said, yeah. I said, well, the music doesn't start with you. She said, what do you mean? I said, the music starts with the Father, Son, Spirit, and they share it with you. They're thrilled to see it coming out. It doesn't have to be perfect. They've recognized what's happening. You're participating. And she, I said, you know how you, know how you love soccer? And you know how mama loves gardening? And and how we all love to cook in our family. I said, that's all starts with the Father, Son, Spirit, and they share it with us, and we get to live it out. But if we've got a sacred, secular pair of glasses on, none of that counts as God. That's all just human. So if we're going to do God thing, we've got to go do church thing. And that's not the way it works. This world belongs to the Father, Son, and Spirit. They create music. They create flowers. They create gardening. They create wine. They create exquisite food and they share their ideas and they want people to participate. And we are, uh, we are participating and most of us don't know it. And we don't know how to honor others that are. And that's what we're asking for light. I am the light of the world, not the church, not a religious things, the whole cosmos. So I, I just find that to be most beautiful. Thank so, you. I got to do so you, you, you heard too. So what do you do? Nothing. No, one second. Let me please. I'm talking to her. Say, Jesus, I don't want no. to. No. He makes fishing lures and he does things, right? Yes. What do you, what do, you do? I'm a nurse. Wow. A nurse. You're a nurse. A nurse. She's, you're participating in the kingdom. What do you do? You paint. What are you doing? What do you do? Design. Ah. <laughs> what do you do? I ride my bike. No. Yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> no, but you said, are you all paying? You know, I think Baxter has spent four hours talking about so much, and we've all, and and you know, he said something very wise on Thursday. If we're just paying attention, right? And Baxter said, we're separating the secular from the sacred. You know, we've been taught this bad theology and this bad doctrine. You know, can you get back in the middle? I want to tell you something. Get back up there. Now, no, I want to share something with you. Uh, yeah, you should, you should hide. No, no, sorry. If, if we're paying attention, right? And I've never done this twice. Stand there, don't sit down. No, if, if we're paying attention, because you all think I'm really funny and sarcastic and I make jokes. And, but we're not paying attention. What did she call you? Come on. What does that mean? I wasn't even here when you were talking about names and all. I was outside talking to that guy that Gigi dumped on me. Um, <laughs> it's a joke. It's a joke. I only no, heard Gigi dumped on me. Yeah, yeah, you had to. You get the rest of it. See you now, listen. I was paying attention to the camera. Oh, what's it? No. Wow. Don't steal my thunder. Um, so, what is Kamoi? Trustworthy, intu in inventive, and affectionate. Wow. Oof. What do I always call? What do I always call you? Master. Master, right? And we all think we're being. I'm seeing so cute and so funny. And I don't know what else you say behind my back that I keep calling you master. After ask Ashley, you know, she tell me the truth. So when she did come on and you did all the name stuff, I googled your name. Which one? Come on. Come on. Twan means sir. Mm. One minute. I didn't even know this took three minutes. It means master. Wow. Would I call you? Master. master. But this is not a persona that you need to put forth. Right. Because you're very good at, shut up. We're very good at putting forth personas. <laughs> this is your identity that you got to start living out of, you know. Yeah. You don't need to fake it. Yeah. You don't, all of us, I'm not talking to you only. Right. We're all faking it. Yeah, we are. We're not living it out. It's funny, I Googled your name, I said, what does Tuan mean? And it's the joke I've been making, master. Yeah. But it's not to, oh, I'm the master now. Right. Or I'm the nurse now. Or I'm the painter now. Or I'm the IT man now. Or I'm the architect now. 
the, the, this this is all we're, we're separating too much and we're, we're not and i wonder we're listening to back and i was just playing with it and it's funny it says sir master lord used as a form of respectful address to a male by malay speaking persons malaysian yeah just i wanted you to stand there and receive that thank you Thank but you. in your soul, in yeah. your heart. Yes. 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 Domingo that he asked me something else. Oh, also. Domingo. You know Domingo? Yeah. Oh, there he is. Yeah, he said his hand up for like an hour. Yeah. Thank you, Domingo, okay, for your was, I'm sorry I kept you. I, and I we're going to close with Domingo, but we're going to let you ask. We're not going to you wait it patiently, which we appreciate it. So ask your question. You need to mute yourself, Domingo. You, you need to unmute yourself. He cannot, Giorgio, he says. I don't know why. So can you can he type it and can you type the question and then Giorgio will ask it for you? Sir, can you share with us if your experience once you get to a point of I am and healing and in that process you feel that you are not that you are going back to I am not separation opposing. I don't know if that makes sense. That makes sense, Baxter. Come back. Tease it out a little bit more so I can get specific with it. Yeah, he's not working. He must be at work. Oh, the Georgia. Yeah. And Georgia. Repeat it. Yeah, he's typing right now. I see him typing. Yeah. So, but you did hear the question, right, Baxter? Repeat. Yeah, yeah. I just want to. I want to get more dialed in on it. Okay. So. Can you share with us, is your experience, once you get to a point of I am and healing, and in that process you feel that you are going back to I am not, separation opposing? Yeah, the, the dynamic is uh, um, ongoing and you learn. It's just like, um, it's like in sports, um, you know, you learn people's tendencies like if you're a pitcher and you know this guy doesn't hit an inside fastball well um then after a while he knows when he walks up the plate you're coming with an inside fastball because you know, so the evil one is is trying to trip us up and after a while we learn some of his tricks and you feel it coming uh so uh i like to say it this way what used to put me off for a year now puts me off for a week um it, it's not that you, you know i don't think that we're going to arrive until we graduate to the cloud of witnesses and we see everything you know i, I think i think when we see i am there we're going to go oh man i'm not even sure i was a believer you know uh but but we make serious progress here and that's what the apostle paul is saying that's what john is saying about i am and the beloved and owning it and you learn the Bible speaks of sudden fear, like in the Proverbs and in the Psalms. So you're driving down the road and sudden fear hits you. Uh, after a while, you begin to recognize this. Oh, this is sudden fear. And it may take a while, but so when sudden fear hits me, I typically do this, 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 and this. And that sends this and this and this signals to my family or people around me. I don't want to do that. I don't have to do that. So I recognized it. Oh, this is sudden fear. Uh, I don't want to go there. Uh, Jesus, what do I do? You know, and it, you learn and then he'll come at you another way. But all the while, it's what um, what I call the education of the human race. That what evil throws at you, the Father, Son, and Spirit are going to transform so that the thing that hits you creates sudden fear in time is going to be it's going to become a sacrament of the father's love jesus presence with you in the spirit's joy so instead of it triggering fear you could go oh, oh man thank you lord jesus you love me and so that's the way they work in you to to defeat is they're going to transform transfigure whatever it is that the evil one hits with us eventually that's going to become a sacrament of, of joy uh it takes time um and you learn your own tendencies you, you you begin to see them uh you begin to see what you do you you see your pose well why am i posing why did i suddenly go into pose well because i got hit with something internally that shouted i am not so i'm 
you know, going to look the part. <laughs> and you have a good laugh at yourself. And, and eventually the very thing that sends you into posing is going to send you into gratitude. Um, and these things take time and we do it in community and we, and we learn to laugh with one another. And, and we just get off our judgmental horses in comparison. Cause uh, I, I remember at a meeting one time, uh, a guy got up to speak and he said, um, he said, I want to tell you, he says, I've been drunk for three weeks. Well, I've been, I've been sober for the last week, but three weeks in a row, I was just drunk. And he said, uh, I'm not a drunk, but I did that. And I, I bring this back to Jesus and say, this is what I did. And, and Jesus, I, I know, let's, let's deal with what's underneath that that's driving that. And you responded. So in time, the, when this happens again, instead of you getting drunk, you know, this becomes a moment of gratitude and a communion with me. Um, but I just thought it was beautiful. He didn't, he did hang his head in shame. You know, like one more time, I'm just living proof that I'm just no damn good. Uh, he just said, no, I did this. Um, I don't want to do this. That's what I did. And, and so we bring our folly up, we bring our sudden fears up and we learn that. Um, and you can see it with the way you, you, um, you treat people like yesterday, uh, Beth had finished with probably a hundred Christmas cards and several of them were international and she had asked me would I go mail them and I said I would but something came up and I had to deal with it and which meant I had to run over to my office and I had to get on zoom and and, and I just looked at her and I just I can't deal with this right now and, and left and I thought oh, no, 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 no 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 not this time back up I got a lot on my plate and I'm kind of scared and frantic right now but I'll be okay and I'll be back and I'll mail them later I, I just I got to go do this right now. It's that as opposed to making her feel like crap, because like all she's doing is mailing cars and I'm dealing with God, you know, that kind of stuff. It's like you learn that, you know, I don't I don't want to spend the next week in that cesspool where she's hurt and I hurt her out of my hurt. And, you know, so you see it. Oh, my gosh. How many times I got to live through this one before I recognize? No, 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 I don't want to do that. So. And I said, I'll be back at 3.30 and I'll mail I'll, I'll go take care of it. Um, and I, man, three o'clock came, got off the call, said, we went straight home. I walked in at 3.27, said, I'm, let me have the stuff. I'll go mail it right now. And so it's like that little thing probably stopped, you know, a week's worth of unnecessary angst in our relationship, just because this time I caught it and I, I don't want to go there. And this is what we're all learning together. We're learning to do it together. Um, and, and let me, let me tell one, one last story. Um, because this involves Miami. Um, I was in Toronto, Canada several years ago. We had done the conference and we were having a potluck dinner at, at someone's home. And, um, I don't do I, I don't like the guru thing. And anytime I feel like that's what's happening, I just want to go you know, over in the corner because I'm, I'm not the guru. I'm a man on a journey and I can share with you what I've learned and where I failed. And that anyway, so I was kind of feeling like I was being turned into the guru a little bit, which probably wasn't the case, but it was what I felt. So I got my plate and I looked over, over in the other room in the corner by himself was a man and I, I beelined it in there and I sat down. I said, so, so what do you do? Um, and he looked down, he said, uh, I'm a truck driver. You know, in other words, I, you know, I'm not a guru. I'm just a truck driver. I said, well, wh what do you haul? He said, flowers. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, twice a week, I drive from Toronto or that area of Ontario. And I drive all the way to Miami. And I pick up a whole transport truck trailer full of flowers, fresh flowers, and drive them back. And I said, wow. I said, have you, have you ever thought about how many people you, you were blessing in doing that? I mean, 
how many engagements, how many Valentines, how many funerals are you helping a little bit to make a, a little bit more bearable because of the life that you bring in your flowers? And, you know, and, and he, he looked up like, mm -hmm. now, now we'll get, and then he said to me, I, he said, I challenge you Baxter, name me one thing in your entire house that wasn't delivered on a truck. See, I, in that conversation, I'm thinking, who's thinking about the people that are growing flowers or gathering flowers from around the world into Miami is having anything to do with the kingdom? Who's thinking the guy driving the truck twice a week back and forward from there to, to Miami to Toronto is having anything to do with the kingdom? And the whole spiritual world just makes him think he's just a truck driver and we can't see what he is. And in that moment, you know, he, he was recognized as being a participant in Jesus. And he responded by sitting up and looking at me and asking, you know, that question, which is a great question. Um, but we're trained to think of people on kind of a, a hierarchy. That's what we've been given in America or in the West. And truck drivers is a good thing, but it's not up there with whatever we think is, you know, sports, celebrity, whatever. I mean, it just, you know, drives a truck well he's not just driving a truck he's participating in the life of the father son and spirit and uh, his flowers are baptized and beautiful bless people so when we begin to see these things it it um changes the way we, we relate to people it doesn't matter about their race their sex their religion their culture N none of that matters that's not the point all of that is irrelevant to this is a person in Jesus Christ who's on a journey, who's sharing in it and probably doesn't understand it. And it's beautiful and twisted at the same time. And we get to be the witnesses. And, and it's not something that we do. It's just something that we begin to see because Jesus is transforming us. He's saying, I know you're a runner. And look how far I brought you now. Today's coming where you're not going to run. In fact, the real reason that pushes you to run is going to become an act, a place where we meet. And uh, I, I know you this, I know you do, uh, it's okay. You look back and you see, I look at my life. I see how I was driven by I am not to become. I, I knew that Jesus was answered, but I didn't know how. I'm wrestling with all this at the deepest level that you can go, that I could go. I never wanted to be a theologian. I don't care about theology per se. I care about knowing how Jesus heals us. And I look back and I think, oh my goodness, he's been discipling me the whole time. I didn't even know it. I thought he was up there and I was trying to do for him. You know, it's just like, oh, oh. Um, well, let me, I said one last story, but this will be the last one, I promise, because we all need to go. Um, so when I was in college, I heard a guy preach a sermon. It was at a retreat, you know, and all the guys went to the retreat because the girls were going to be there and we're all sitting there. And he gets up and he, he, he's holding forth about how that God is keeping a video recording of our entire life uh, and our thoughts and what we said and what we didn't say, what we did, what we didn't do. And when we died and we're going to stand in heaven and he's going to hand us a video cassette of, our, you know, your life and you're going to have to play it on the big screen in heaven and everybody is going to see it, including your grandmother and your mother. And of course, you know, it's classic manipulation. You're going to get everybody saved because you say, pray this prayer. Then everybody's going to pray the prayer. So all 200 got saved. So he'd go back to the church and say, I got 200 got saved. So, you know, it's just a big ruse and manipulative. And anyway, so I thought about it through the years. And I thought, you know, when you die, uh, Jesus meets you and he hands you uh, a DVD. And you look at it and it says, your life and contribution to the kingdom of God thing okay and he invites you into a private room because he's not into shame and and there's a big tv in there and his video player and motions for you to push so you put it in the dvd player blu-ray whatever it is and you hit it the blue screen comes up and you kind of stand back this ought to be interesting my life and contribution to the kingdom of god oh boy and it's blue and after you know four five ten seconds it's, it's still blue and you think, well, I, I punch play again, and it remains blue. And about the time you get like, wait a minute, Jesus, 
wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. You know, I prayed for a bunch of people and I went to church and and I preached some sermons. I did some funerals, I even did a few weddings, and I was there. I mean, there's something gotta be on here. There's nothing on here. And about the time you get extremely frustrated with Jesus being not fair and, and the injustice of it, he hands you another DVD. And this one says, not you, but Christ in you, the hope of glory. And you put this in and hit play, and it shows you the conversation of the Father, Son, and Spirit before your conception. It shows their joy at your conception. It shows them involved in your whole life, sharing their concerns, their interests, their delights with you. It shows them nurturing you in your participation in those things. And all the way through your entire life, you have been a part of this. And it's been bubbling forth from you. It's twisted. There's brokenness there, but you can see it. And you think, oh my goodness. I've always been a part of this. Oh, you even named me Charles. Oh, are trustworthy. Oh, I get, I'm seeing it. That, that's both simultaneously the judgment of God and the liberation of God, simultaneously. The judgment is the crisis. I'm not going to let you interpret yourself the way you interpret yourself. So I'm going to shine a light in here and it's going to burn because then you, you really are invested in this interpretation and we're going to let you get free from that. And at the same time, the way I'm freeing you is by showing you who you really are and what's really been going on in your life all along. Um, that's the truth. And it does set us free. And then you begin to see it happening in people all around you, especially people that you don't think ought to have any Jesus in them. That's when it gets really good because Jesus is way bigger and this is his world. And I say, amen. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so very much, Baxter. We can wait to have you here with us in person. And um, we're already planning that fishing trip for you. We've been planning it for two years. <laughs> like, who's gonna take him? <laughs> um, anyhow, just truly thank you. We bless you, we bless your family, all of your wife, Beth, your grandkids, and all your children. And. Um, have a wonderful Christmas and an amazing new year. And um, just also before we close, um, could you close up in prayer? And um, we thank you. So would you pray for Oh, yeah, you're asking me. You're looking over to the other side like you're looking. No, because I can see you here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll be glad. Uh, I'll be honored. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you for my brothers and sisters in Miami and Hope for Life and what's going on there. I pray uh, bountiful blessings and resources on this ministry. Uh, help them to realize that uh, they're not to create a ministry, they're to participate in what they're doing, and you will grow it at your speed. Uh, pray for those that were listening today that, that whatever word spoke to them, thank you for that. And uh, bring light and thank you holy spirit we'll, we will have more please protect us and and holy spirit we ask that you would bring about a revelation of jesus christ in our country that will blow everyone's mind and thrill hearts amen amen, amen. god bless you thank you, we love you.